This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. It's three minutes after ten and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where once again we find ourselves enormously grateful to the Parliamentary Conservative Party for ensuring that the days of us not knowing what on earth we would be able to talk about on air feel a hundred years away. Um, they're at it again. It's just surreal. A, a circular firing squad where everybody's managed to miss everybody else, as far as I can tell, and where 30p Lee Anderson has turned out to be a hysterical flouncing halfwit, as the inimitable Ian Dunt put it this morning on Twitter. I mean, who knew? Who could possibly have looked at that sage of our time, that model of empathy and insight, and thought to themselves, ha, huh, I bet he turns out to be a hysterical flouncing halfwit. But here we are. Um, and of course, he wasn't alone. The other fella with the hyphen, Brendan Clark something, he has resigned as well. Uh, how many deputy chairmen are there? How many deputy chairmen of the Conservative Party does it take to change a light bulb? I, I haven't got a punchline for that joke. But I don't know how many deputy chairmen of the, or chairpersons of the Conservative Party there actually are. Does anybody know? Does that, I mean, is it like one of those things at the fair? When you have all the marbles in a jar, all the jelly beans in a jar, do you get a prize if you can count all the deputy chairpersons of the Conservative Party? You get a, a, a bottle of pomaine. Is that still a thing? And then you come to the rebellion, which isn't going to happen as far as I can tell. It, it will be, as far as I can tell, and according to my clever colleague upstairs, there's quite a strong chance that the rebellion won't reach double figures later today. The number of people actually voting against the... Uh, the bill uh, that will send the so-called Rwanda bill to the, or, or rather voting in favour of the amendments, will struggle to reach double figures, which means the whole thing goes to its third reading uh, unmolested, unchallenged, unchanged. So what an almighty mess. And we could laugh about it. I, I'm, and obviously we will laugh about it. But we laugh with a, with a, with a, with a sense of sadness. For two reasons. The first is, if you believe in parliamentary democracy, and if you are even pretending to be patriotic, you have to profess faith in parliamentary democracy. Um, it, it's very sad to see a party in such parlous condition. I, I mean, truly sad to see. Uh, albeit that they all deserve it, there must still be a few people on the Conservative benches who are... Uh, grimacing in horror at what their party has become. We know because we talk about it quite often uh, on the uh, on the programme that there are plenty of people who have and in some cases continue to consider themselves conservative supporters who grimace and, and clench their buttocks daily in horror at what their party has become. A party where 30p Lee Anderson and Brendan Clark something can both be described as senior Tories. Just let that sink in. I hate it when people say just let that sink in, but some, sometimes, like once a year, I think it works. Could you imagine that that part... So in 2019, people like David Gork and Dominic Grieve, Rory Stewart, Nicholas Soames, they all left the Conservative Party. And people like 30p Lee and Brendan Clark something and Jonathan Hulis, they all came in to the Conservative Party. That would be a bit like taking, I, I don't know, let's not go Ronaldo, Messi and, uh, and, and Lineker levels of substitution, but it, but it would be like taking uh, Premier League footballers off the park and replacing them with people from the National League South, wouldn't it? Actually, that's not fair on the National League South. If we still got the bees of Homes League, what's below that? that well, it'd be Sunday morning football that, from your kids. Sunday morning football team. It'd be like taking Premier League. For, this is what the Conservative Party did after D Dominic Johnson and Boris Cummings undertook their putsch, their cull, their purge. They removed parliamentarians from the parliamentary party who were I didn't agree with them about much, except probably the idiocy of Brexit in most of those cases. But they removed parliamentarians who were Premier League standard by any measure and they replaced them with people who would struggle to get in to a Sunday morning pub team. And within four years, the people who would struggle to get into a Sunday morning pub team are being described by client journalists as senior Tories. What 
an extraordinary mess Rishi Sunak has presided over. Now, I don't know what question to ask you this morning. We have already done what are they playing at with regard to the Rwanda bill. I saw a reminder on uh, Twitter yesterday that the bill, I haven't double checked the dates, but I've got no reason to doubt it. I can't remember who it was that said it, but it was definitely someone who I consider to be reliable. I think the Rwanda bill was only introduced by Boris Johnson the day after the Sue Gray report came out. So it sort of gave right-wing media something else to stick on their front pages or something else to talk about because of the Sue Gray report being simultaneously, of course, a damp squib and also a terrible conspiracy designed to undermine the greatest prime minister this country has ever seen. So I'm pretty sure it was never intended to come to this because the thing about Boris Johnson... And I don't think this is an exaggeration or an embellishment. I think Boris Johnson could just never have mentioned it again. I genuinely believe that. I, well, you know and I know that, as with Donald Trump, who we talked about a bit yesterday, uh, that, that there is no depth to which these people will not stoop. That there is no unpleasantness or, 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 or uh, example of moral corruption that would be beneath them. There's nothing beneath them. They, they, you can go no lower than a, than a Trump or a Johnson. And therefore, I think that having successfully thrown the dead cat of the idea of deporting people to a country where uh, opponents of the government are still locked up, kidnapped and tortured, deporting genuine asylum seekers, not failed asylum seekers, deporting them there, processing their applications and then leaving them there for the rest of their life. I don't think it was ever supposed to, to happen. I, it's a bit from Boris Johnson's point of view. It's a bit like Brexit. It was never actually supposed to happen. It was designed entirely as an exercise in self-interest. Oh, my God. Isn't that an interesting parallel? It was never supposed to happen, folks. It was just an exercise in self-interest. It was an exercise in self-protection or, or self-promotion. What's the best thing I can do at the moment? Well, the best thing I can do at the moment is to pretend that I think Brexit is a good idea because that will enhance my chances of becoming Prime Minister when the Remain side win and I battle against George Osborne for the leadership of the Conservative Party after David Cameron has resigned. Of the many stupid things David Cameron has done, letting it be known that he was going to resign in the event of winning that election in 2015 was probably among the stupidest. And then... You have, a few years later, when his government was facing, well, when his position was becoming untenable, when he had already endured, uh, or rather committed many acts that would have ended most political careers, the one that really did feel like a ticking time bomb suddenly got louder with the publication of the Sue Gray report. They came out that week and said, we're going to deport boat people to Rwanda. And I, I, I say to you today... I don't think that he ever intended it to happen. I, I think his intention was to mention it a few times and then pretend he never had. And do you know what's really interesting? I think he would have got away with it because people like the Three Muppeteers and Jonathan Gullis had a kind of, oh, I, don't, I don't know what word to use really, I, I, well, let's just say cultish. Uh, a cultish regard for Boris Johnson. You know, in the way that we talked about Trump yesterday and how previously sensible politicians have sacrificed any vestiges of, of integrity uh, at the altar of his cultish status. Well, you know, we're kind of short of sensible MPs, but 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 the likes of, of 30p Lee and Brendan Clark something and uh, Jonathan grunt they they kind of had i don't know what it was i don't know if it was a sort of weird class-based deference in that they honestly thought boris johnson was somehow better than them because of the way that he talked or the, or the school that he went to do you know that gullis once said that when he was a teacher he used to model his persona on boris johnson and jacob rees mogg and they let him near children can you believe that someone modeling themselves on boris johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg was allowed to um, exercise influence over young minds. It's quite terrifying, really, in many ways. But that is my theory. That is my answer to the question of how the heck did this happen, is that the Rwanda proposal, the Rwanda idea, 
was never supposed to be law. It was never supposed to be a proper policy. It was about as accurate and as honest as the claim that they'd built 40 new hospitals or that he'd got all the big calls right. In fact, file it in the same box as getting all, all the big calls right and building 40 new hospitals. It was just something to say, not something to do. The essence of Boris Johnson, really, was something to say, not something to do. I never lied to the House of Commons. I built 40 hospitals. I got all the big calls right. I got Brexit done. Don't examine the reality or the facts of what I'm claiming. Just do it. So I think the question I want to ask you is... How much of this is Rishi Sunak's fault and how much of it was utterly unavoidable? And the mess that he finds himself in today, he has ended up being a prime minister for whom the departure of Lee Anderson from his government is being reported as bad news in right-wing newspapers. I can't imagine there has ever been a room from which Lee Anderson has departed without everybody else in it, at the very least breathing a sigh of relief and quite possibly breaking out in a spontaneous round of applause. But Lee Anderson leaves the Conservative government, and that is apparently bad news for Rishi Sunak. So how has this happened? 03456060973. How has this ludicrous, this ludicrous Rwanda brain fart of Boris Johnson's ended up hobbling the Tory party in the most spectacular and public way? But, but the question, perhaps, that might be even more interesting, and I can tell you now, it'd be quite easy to get through in the, in the first few minutes of this conversation because because these are quite nebulous questions and, and that they often take a little bit more thinking, but I, you obviously have to do the thinking. How, how much of this is Rishi Sunak's fault? How much of this has he brought upon himself? And I think we can all reliably describe it as a mess. How much of this mess has Rishi Sunak brought upon himself? And how much of it has essentially been done unto him? Because, because I don't know. I, I'm not suggesting for a moment that you conjure up any scintilla of sympathy for Rishi Sunak. The man is a, he's a blancmange. He's a blancmange in curiously short trousers. But I don't know what else he could have done having inherited a Boris Johnson-flavoured gimmick. So how much of the Rwanda mess is Rishi Sunak's fault? Hit the numbers now. You will, you will get through. 0345 6060973. I suppose technically he hasn't left the government. He's left the, 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 the deputy chairman of the party. Is that a government role? It's a party role, isn't it, Rob? But you know what I mean. Um, say Rishi Sunak's team. He's quit Rishi Sunak's team. And, and then I, I, I am interested in the question of how such... Is, it, is, is the word pygmy offensive? In the, uh, is it, 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 I suppose it, it probably is if you're using it as a pejorative because it describes real people. So I can't use it. I won't use that word. But how can such flotsam and jetsam how can so many obviously stupid people have ended up exercising influence over the conservative party one of the ugliest things about the british class system is very posh people who enjoy enormous privilege thinking that a knuckle dragger like lee anderson somehow represents working class interests he doesn't represent working class interests any more than jacob rees mogg is anti-establishment it's absolutely extraordinary the way that posh people use the worst possible examples of people from humbler backgrounds as exemplars of what everybody from the so-called working class must be like. Angela Rayner is, is working class, and you wouldn't catch her spouting the kind of uh, zero IQ bilge that 30p Lee comes out with on a daily basis. But how have they ended up? At Gullis on with Ferrari this morning, effectively demanding that Rishi Sunak invites him round for tea. How have these Johnny-come-latelys with the political acumen of a, of a pepperami, how have they ended up feeling as if they exercise genuine influence over the body politic, not just over the Conservative Party, but over the country? 
absolutely unbelievable. So there's a bunch of questions there. Come at it from any angle you like. How much of this is Rishi Sunak's fault? And I don't know whose answer to that is most interesting, the Conservative supporter or, or the Conservative um, rejecter. Let's find out. You're all welcome. 0345 6060973. Number two is... <laughs> How have people like Brendan Clark something and 30p Lee ended up in positions of apparent influence in your party or in the party and in our country? I, I've got an answer to that, but I've, I've detained you for long enough with this introduction. 0345 6060 973. And number three, which knits both questions together. How have they ended up with this absolute pudding of a policy being so stupid and so daft that it was supposed to hurt the Labour Party, the Rwanda policy. Or was it? Was it just supposed to give Boris Johnson one news cycle when the Partygate report wouldn't be leading news bulletins? But, you know, they see it as something to, with which to hurt the Labour Party. And yet all it's done is turn the Parliamentary Conservative Party into a circular firing squad that, that can't even get a shot on target. 03456060973. It's 1019. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 22 minutes after 10. It was it was a chap called Russ, Russ Jones, uh, who wrote a rather splendid book called the, De the Decade in Tory and has got another one on the way called Four Chancellors and a Funeral. You can tell they're good because when I check on my performance on Amazon, I often note that people who've bought How They Broke Britain have also brought, bought um, The Decade in Tory. He was the one who tweeted uh, about the, um, uh, the Rwanda debacle coming out but roughly the time that the Sue Gray report was published and so clearly being designed to provide Boris Johnson with some cover. It was never, it, it, it was like that with Nell and I scene. We've, we've gone on holiday by mistake, they say to the farmer. It's, it's like Rishi Sunak is saying to the country, we've, we've come up with a policy by mistake or we've ended up with a policy by mistake. And I am actually going to open up the, um, the doors to that question of how many Conservative Party deputy chairman it takes to change a light bulb because you've come up with some quite good answers. It didn't have a punchline. Well, Laura in Renfrew, I think, has adapted this from another light bulb joke who says um, it, it doesn't take any Tory party deputy chairman to change a live light bar. Oh, it takes one, one to hold it while the whole world revolves around them. That's quite good, but I, I think that's been used in other contexts, hasn't it? Uh, and Tim Burnett comes up with, uh, how many Tory party chairmen does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is none. They all sit in the dark and claim that the light is still working. These, these are good. I like both of these. So if you want to join in that game, how many Tory party deputy chairman does it take to change a light bulb, then you can text 84850. Or uh, ideally, because it's easier for me to track it, you can tweet at Mr. James OB. So how much of this Rwandan mess is Rishi Sunak's fault? And how much of it is a combination of inheritance and infliction? Your thoughts interest me today because I'm, I'm not sure it's clear. Or at least it's not clear to me. Martin is in Malvern. Martin, what would you like to say? Hello, first time caller, a bit nervous. Welcome, Mark. Well, let me, <laughs> let me put you at your ease by asking you some unexpected questions. Go on, then. Have you checked out the new Victorian uh, decorations at Great Morven Station yet? No, I haven't. Have you heard about them? Yes, I have. Yes. Why, why haven't you been down there? Because I, I use Morven Link Station, which oh, is... Yes. Well, it's better for access, isn't it? But great, great. I mean, what they've done is is do the, the, the Victorian shelters and the Victorian platform awnings in, in incredibly bright, colourful colours. Are they the original Victorian colours, do we know? Or is it just someone having a flight of fancy? I, I don't know. I will go there this afternoon. I will have a walk. There what time? Afternoon. What time do you think you might be down there? Um, two o'clock. Oh, I'm off. By. If you could get down there at 10 to 1, you could come on and describe them to us live on the radio. You, right. You could go you could go from being a first time caller to a live <laughs> reporter in the space of an hour and twenty minutes. Uh, that oh, doesn't right. happen on other programmes, nice Martin. One. Nice one. What nice have you got? One. Back to Rishi Sunak. Uh, entirely his fault. Right. Uh, completely and utterly. When, when he first got elected, he, he made the huge mistake of uh, of not standing up to the idiots in his party. <laughs> And he, he appointed Sir Oliver Abraham again, which yes. was the number one mistake. So, and that meant but, Rwanda had to have. There's no yeah. way he could have put her back in the home office. Entirely his, his fault. He, yeah. he was, 
You know, he's just got, he hasn't got a backbone. If he'd have stood up to the idiots, the fascists, the right wing lot in his party, and he could have taken the Conservative Party back towards the centre ground, and then they might have had a chance of um, doing something in the election. But he, he just hasn't got a backbone. He's completely useless. And well, what did, well, what do you think he thought was going to happen? Because he, he, uh, he couldn't have known it was going to end up this... Or could he? What, was he just crossing his fingers? Was he focusing I, so much on I, getting himself into Downing Street that he didn't really worry about what was going to happen as I, a consequence of what he did to get there? I think that explains it exactly. Yes. He, he, he doesn't think beyond the, the end of his nose. He's, he's got no uh, political acumen. He's got no... Oh, no idea. He, say what you feel, Martin. <laughs> Crikey. Uh, well, the sooner the sooner he's got rid of, the better. The sooner the Conservatives have got rid of, the better. Um, stop, stop the Tories. Stop vote. I'd recommend everybody in the whole country to look at that one uh, when it comes up to the election time because it'll give you the the best. Um, person to vote for to get rid of the Tories. This is the, t- this is the tactical voting website, yeah. I think. Well, you, Stop. crikey, you've filled your boots, haven't you, on your, yeah. on your debut <laughs> on the programme? You're not well, hanging around. <laughs> also, <laughs> I would recommend everybody in the whole country to have a listen to, uh, have a watch and a listen of a little video thing twice a day called A Different Bias, and it's by a bloke called Phil Morho- Morehouse, and he is absolutely fantastic. Well, He's a Labour, I... Labour Party member, and he... he sums it up beautifully every day so. i'm glad to hear it I, I mean i haven't had the opportunity to check that out before you endorsed it but i'm putting my faith in you and uh, it, and, and trusting that it's not potty mouthed or libelous no, or no, any of the all. above but um but no. as i'll tell you what Suzanne in scotland's just said your first time caller sounds like a pro <laughs> i did phone up um, radio five live a long never, time never ago heard of it because there was a 20-year-old uh, singing the praises of Margaret Thatcher about how wonderful she was, and I couldn't, I just couldn't take it, so I explained to him about the destruction of uh, Fair enough. villages and whatever in Well, he's director-general of a Tufton Street think tank now, Martin, so, so the work the work was not, the work was in vain 20, Thank you, and I'm only, I'm not joking if you are, if you do, if you do head down to Great Malvern before one o'clock, I'd love to get a first-hand eyewitness description of what they've done on the platforms, it looks absolutely beautiful, and as I get older I find stuff, I'm not even being ironic anymore, I find stuff like that absolutely uh, transporting if you pardon the pun. Kate's in Leicester Kate, what's going on? Well firstly I just want to say as a 21 year old I am not going to be singing the virtues of Margaret Thatcher so we're all good. That's <laughs> a so relief because Martin's gone now go on. <laughs> um, well, I was going to say Stella Braverman as well but uh... the deal he made with her which meant she was brought back in I think if he hadn't done that he w- the Rwanda would have kind of like they, out at yeah. that point. And they could have all pretended it never happened, couldn't they? Which I'm pretty sure was Johnson's original intention. And because she tries to be a populist, Braverman could never really have turned on Johnson in the way that she could turn on Sunak. And I think because Truss had just sacked her, he did. He didn't have to do it. Like it would have been. It wouldn't have been like, oh, he's missed someone out. It would have been she has just been fired. It's amazing, it is isn't it? That, that... Not yeah. Everybody sort of sensible or, or vaguely decent considers her to be absolutely toxic, and yet client media and elements of the Tory party consider her to be some sort of standard bearer. I, 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 I think the calculation was, or the, the received wisdom is, that she could have delivered the ERG to Johnson, believe it or not. And, and Johnson was very much hoping for... A resurrection uh, over that weekend, that, that 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 weekend when it happened, and therefore, in return for delivering the ERG to Sunak, or or at least ensuring that they wouldn't be um, backing Johnson as a homogenous block, she was promised her job back in the Home Office. At which point, I think you're right. Uh, Rwanda became undroppable, didn't well- it? Would it be worth considering whether if Johnson hadn't kind of been like, oh, do I run, do I not, would he have needed Braverman? So is it back to Johnson? Yeah, he needed her to get the numbers. I think he needed, there, there, there were sort of MPs who'd been part of the, the decision to get rid of him who were persuadable to become part of the decision to bring him back. But um, I, 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 I think that was the deal. The deal with the devil, in a sense, that has come back to well came back to haunt Sunak again and again and again and again so I don't know does that mean he's brought it on himself or that it has been inflicted upon him because if he hadn't done it he probably wouldn't have got into Downing Street and we'd be probably sitting here 
now reporting Boris Johnson's second resignation in disgrace. A disgraced former Prime Minister Boris Johnson came back as Prime Minister and disgraced himself again. A bit like, of course, Suella Braverman did in the Home Office, where she managed to get sacked twice. Thomas Watts is here now with the headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10.35. I suppose if you're looking for a football analogy, you could do worse than turn to a footballer. Um, and, and Stan Collymore's been in touch to point out that the substituting of politicians like David Gork and uh, Dominic Grieve, Anna Subri, Rory Stewart, Nicholas Soames, for knuckleheads like Jonathan Gullis, Brendan Clark something and... Uh, 30p Lee, um, Stan points out, it's like substituting Harry Kane for Ali Deer, the guy who played for Southampton for a game after Graham Souness was told that he was George Weir's cousin. He turned out literally to be just some bloke off the street. Um, I quite like that one. And I quite like some of the answers to the question of how many deputy Tory uh, uh, Tory deputy chairs it takes to change a light bulb. Um, uh, DT writes one, although 12 of them will claim the replacement bulb on expenses. Marcus writes, they don't change light bulbs, James. They just tell everyone to wait for some more electricity to trickle down. Right, that was Marcus Jervis. Richard Marsden writes, how many deputy Tory chairmen does it take to change a light bulb? None, James, but they will pay for a Tory donor to change it for a couple of billion pounds. These are good, aren't they? Uh, Chris, Dr. Chris Roberts uh, says, how many Tory party deputy chairmen does it take to change a light bulb? None. The light bulb have been smashed to pieces because they adhered to EU energy regulations. Good old British candlelight is much better. And uh, Sweet Silver Song writes, how many deputy Tory chairman does it take to change a light bulb? One to get the contract to remove the perfectly good one and store it. One to get the VIP lane contract to make a new one from Papier-Mâché. And one to run a consultancy firm to defend the non-working paper light bulb. Um, there are more. There's also an awful lot of support, I have to say, for Martin in Morvan's um, peon to Phil Morehouse's political commentary, which I am not familiar with, but lots of you are, which is probably probably a, a fairly good indicator that it's well worth a look, isn't it? Um, and, and more of those to come. But back to the main issue of the moment. Andy's in Abingdon. The, this mess that Rishi Sunak, has he got himself into it or has it happened to him? Morning, James. How are you doing? Very well, Andy. What's going on? Good. Uh, yes, yeah, so my analogy is not going to be quite as good as the other ones we've just heard. But uh, you and I are around the same age and you'll remember the school disco and yes. how some of us were the uncool guys at the end. Rishi's always struck me as one of the geeky guy at the end of the... Yeah. Uh, school disco waiting desperately for the good looking girl to choose him and looking around at the bullies and all of that thinking they're the cool guys i'll have them around me but, um, if i could just nudge you towards the question i'm asking about whether or not this has happened to him or whether or not he has sort of brought it on himself mate i much as i enjoy 1980s disco analogies we, 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 we've got quite a few people <laughs> waiting yeah no no but that's literally the point really is the fact that he's still there in his mind, hoping that those guys can help him when in reality they're just after his job rather than his girl now. Mm, I don't really follow. No, no, it's just an analogy that he's still the kid, little kid who's hoping that other people can help him instead of taking charge of the party now. Uh, he should have come in when he came in and said, right, we're doing it this way rather than Oh, okay. I don't, do you know, I plan. don't think, I, I mean, for future reference, I don't think you needed an analogy. I think you'd have been better off just going straight in with your opinion. So now I understand what you're saying now is that he has. Um, uh, he hasn't come he, out of that he, stage. He sat there waiting. He's sat waiting for yeah. things to happen in his favour rather than actually acting in a way that defines how things yeah. move forward. And right. those un other uncool kids for different reasons. I just told you to drop the analogy. Reasonable. Stop the analogy and just talk to me in plain <laughs> English. The analogy doesn't work. It's not a good analogy. It says the, 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 the description works. He has come in and waited for things to happen to him, waited for other people to move behind him, waited for other people to act rather than leading. He hasn't led at all. Precisely. There you go. Uh, that's <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you what go. We, that's what we lack and have lacked for so long now. That, uh, yeah, we, yeah. As you would say every day, hopefully we can get to that point where we find some leadership. A little bit of normality returns to the returns to the fray. I, I, I yes, I get it. I'm sorry for being impatient. I just I genuinely didn't quite understand the point you were making. But he and I hadn't thought of him quite that in, in, in with that level of clarity actually. What's he actually done? On, Ru on Rwanda. So Rwanda is the thing that's turned into a circular firing squad where all the Tories keep shooting and missing each other. And what's he actually done? 
is entirely in the hands of everybody else. He needed the Rwandan government to come out and say, if you pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights, we'll pull out of this treaty. Although there were a couple of Tories standing up in the House of Commons yesterday, I thought with a fa- vaguely racist subtext, essentially saying, oh, just because a Rwandan politician said it doesn't mean it's true. I don't know if that is a vaguely racist subtext. That's how it struck me. Um, and then he relies upon support from weirdos like Clark Smith and Anderson to get it to to, to, to resist this rebellion. That fails. And then the rebels kind of roll. Uh, yeah, I, I, there's something here. The best thing he could have done when he became prime minister was to say this was a gimmick from Boris Johnson designed to distract the public from the Partygate report that, in a way, uh, was the second last straw um, before the camel's back broke. So we're getting rid of it and we're going to come up with something that actually works. But I don't know if he could have done that, having promised to put Suella Braverman back in the Home Office. Isn't it odd how many roads lead back to a woman whose own CV claimed that she'd helped write a legal textbook um, when the man who actually wrote it came out after she achieved political prominence and said, I think she did a bit of photocopying for me once. Isn't it remarkable, really? What a wonderful emblem of what's happened to the Tory party and, of course, by association but to our country. 10.41 is the time. Michael is in Darwin in Lancashire. Michael, what would you like to say? Oh, yeah. Um, my gut instinct is that while the whole crisis isn't actually Rishi Sunak's fault, yeah. um, it is his fault for carrying on with the charade. Because my, my um, interpretation of it is that to stop the boats, in inverted commas, the best thing to do would be to open up those legal routes that the Conservatives originally closed. Yes that caused this crisis in the first place. So not only have they made their own crisis, they're now trying to deal with it by being as nasty as possible to the current vulnerable group of people they have in their sights. Um, and I, it's, it, it's, what, would, what would have happened if he tried to? Mess. What would have happened if he tried to? Because what you have, I mean, what, what all immigration debates on the right wing of British politics are, are uh, his, historically, post Farage, they're all about trying to come up with ways of not sounding racist when all of your ideas are driven by profound racism. So they pretend it's yeah. only refugees that they're worried about, or bogus refugees. I think Edward Lee stood up yesterday and said something about people pretending to be gay or pretending to be victims of torture. That anything, they come up with anything that just lets them say, no, we don't want you here, whoever yeah. you are. But, but, but the more they try and camouflage that base bigotry, the more, more of a mess they get into with each well, other because, with, because there's always someone sitting next to them who'll go further. They certainly don't speak for some Conservative members because I, I'm, I'm not a Conservative member myself, but right. plenty of my family are. Yes. And it, so many of them uh, quite often say to me, if it had been someone like Rory Stewart, yes. like when he was in the leadership contest, this kind of mess would never have arisen. And I have to agree. And even though I lean to the left, I could have completely got behind somebody like Rory Stewart I, because I, it's hard. He's a decent human being. I, and I, I don't I think you're right. Like this. No, I think, I'd, yes, I'd, I'd, I'd allow that. I, it's, I do think he is a decent human being. He's lucky in a way that, that he has the, uh, the the profile without the scrutiny. It, you know, he did he did a good job at the Foreign Office. Yes. If you hear him talk about it, he was really interested in solutions to problems. But I don't know whether that translates into the big jobs in terms of aptitude. I, I, know, I know him a bit and I like him and I agree with your analysis of his character. But what he wouldn't have done was bet the house on something that he knew couldn't work. It just wouldn't do that. It would be anathema to him to put a, a political energy and political capital into something that was both cruel and stupid and crucially pointless. Because even if it was to work at a level that nobody can even conceive, it wouldn't touch the sides of the problem that it's ostensibly designed to address. Yeah, it's stupid. Because if you, you say, OK, I've got 75 problems, but I'll tell you what, I've dealt with three of them. Yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Well, exactly that. Or, or even it's worse than that, actually. I've got a massive, massive problem, 
but I've dealt with 3% of it. It w would be perhaps the even more powerful way of, of describing it. I noticed Yvette Cooper this morning um, picking up on something that we have been uh, describing for a while on the programme. She, she wrote, wrote, Minister, let's cat out of bag this AM. Rwanda scheme will only cover a tiny percentage of those arriving in UK. Today's ongoing Tory chaos is all for the sake of a policy that costs over £400 million and covers less than 1% of arrivals. The only thing that unites the Tory party is gimmick instead of grip it's quite pithy actually that isn't it all, all, all gimmick no grip would be the uh, neat way of distilling that down and it takes us back to johnson funny how these roads lead back to johnson and braverman johnson's ludicrous self-preservation streak being the reason why the policy got invented in the first place and braverman's ambition and utterly undeserved influence being the reason why rishi sunak couldn't chuck it in the bin does anyone feel sorry for him Genuine question, and, and ring in, 0345 6060973. Does anyone feel sorry for Rishi Sunak? And how close are we, do you think, to doing a phone-in on how can anyone still support the Tories? 0345 6060973. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It was the madness of it that was so dispiriting. You'd think, I, sometimes I envy um, bigots. I, I genuinely do. I, I think that it, deriving enormous pleasure from your political opponent's misfortune I, I must be quite nice. And I can do it a bit, but not when they're in government. You can't derive that much pleasure from them making such an almighty mess of something for the very simple reason that you live here, you know? Uh, that's why I envy Trump supporters, even as their own life goes up in flames. They, they, they love it because it upsets people like me and Sadiq Khan. Uh, that's a reference to something specific. I'm not being completely uh, self-obsessed. Uh, and, and the way yesterday they kept talking about it being a deterrent. It, I tell you what, of all the things I've said about the Conservative Party and immigration, the thing that I think cuts fastest and sharpest to the heart of it is that almost everything is an attempt to object to the existence of foreigners in these islands without actually saying that you object to the existence of foreigners within these islands. That's how they end up tying themselves in such almighty knots. That's how they end up talking about uh, leaving the European Convention on Human Rights. That's how they end up talking about illegals or bogus asylum seekers or creating the idea that everybody that wants to come here is not to be trusted. That's, it's how, that, that's how it happens. But they really, this is why they hold Farage in such high regard in the modern Tory party, because he comes, he's, he's a master of it, of, of sailing so close to the wind um, without hardly ever making clear exactly what he's made of. Of course, there have been occasions when it's been crystal clear what he's made of, and um, I was here for one of them, and of course, the people that like him love that too. So this is a great point that people miss about Farage. When you, when you debag him in a radio studio, when you prove exactly what he's made of, it doesn't alienate people, because everybody who likes him knows exactly what he's made of. And that includes Tory MPs who are currently still not able to drop the fig leaves and say, I just don't like foreigners. And the only people of colour I'm prepared to put up with or tolerate are the ones who profess an even deeper dislike of foreigners than my own. And that's what the T Tory party is full of today. That's how they end up saying things like, it's a deterrent. It's a great deterrent, uh, the Rwanda plan, to which Chris Bryant characteristically responded with an absolute zinger yesterday richard reminds me in a text to 84850 he just said if drowning in the channel is not a deterrent the risk of drowning in the channel is not a deterrent a risk that came um grimly true for five human beings this this very week if that is not a deterrent for people desperate for a new life so desperate for a new life, they're prepared to risk their old life, is a good way of thinking about it. But if that's not a deterrent, then how is a one in a million chance of being sent to Rwanda going to perturb them from making the same journey? Go on, have a think about it. Especially if you've got gammon for brains. Because nobody thinks it's a deterrent. It's not about being a deterrent. It's just about not wanting any foreign people to exist on these islands, but not being able to say so out loud. 
yet. And of course, the Daily Telegraph's push at the moment to shift the party even further to the right on immigration is a push towards a place where they will start sounding like... I, I think you'll get a parliamentary conservative in the next electoral cycle, possibly before, who comes about as close as anyone has come to Enoch Powell in the last 40 years. I think it's going to happen. I'll let you place bets on which one you think it will be. But it, but it, but it, 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 the direction of traffic being dictated by whoever it was that paid a fortune to commission a poll that the Daily Telegraph put on their front page. That, that is the direction of traffic. So how much of it is Sunak's fault? Henry's in Stanton St. John. Is it Stanton St. John or Stanton St. John? St. John. Well, I've asked you that before, I think. <laughs> yeah, you have. Why um, is it not St. John? I always like, I like I these little code words that the posh isn't. people use to make us plebs look stupid. <laughs> I'm not posh. <laughs> no, I know. Um, <laughs> now, listen. I'm, yes. Yeah, I, I do feel... Uh, uh, hear me out. I, I will, I will. This is going to be good. I can tell already. <laughs> I, I do feel sorry for him, but I think he's a complete idiot. What he should have done. <laughs> yes, that's fair. That's a fair position. Go on. Um, what he should have done is waited. They should have put Suella Braverman in. Everyone would have seen how absolutely bonkers she is. And then he should have waited and got run next time for Prime Minister. With a, mm. The problem is he's completely stifled by the 1922 committee and all these lunatics who are like far right. Um, and I don't think he's a bad man. I think he's an intelligent man, but I don't think he can do anything within his party. He's a weak and if man. I was, he's a weak man. He's a weak man. Yeah, yeah, he's a weak man. If I was him, I would call a general election in May and get this done, get them out, because they need to go. And I'm a member of the Tory party, and I'm saying that. That's what it's come to. What do you want to happen next? Um, I want them to go away. I want them to get rid of all the lunatics. I well, that's not going to gonna happen, Henry. Do you not think so? Well, no. I, OK, well, then I will never vote for the Tory party again. Um, but but you'll get a lot of people who are like me, who are left wing Tories, if that's possible, um, and and don't want that. By, by left wing, you loosely mean I, I don't spend my central. I don't mean I don't spend my every living moment animated by the arrival or existence of foreign people. That's that's no, where I the party. That's I, where the party's gone, though, isn't it? Yes. Absolutely. And it's a disgrace. Um, and that's not what the Tory party is about. I think James um, Arbuthnot said something similar yesterday. You know, he's, he's in the Lords now and he was one of the yeah. only politicians. No, I heard him. Did you? Talking about xenophobic yeah. streak, which is euphemistic, I think, in the context of what we're discussing. Really, really sad. Can I just make one more point? Yeah, of course you can. I, this thing about Rory Stewart. I went to school with Rory Stewart. He'd sell his own mother down the line for a bit of power. He's just as bad. <laughs> He's just, he's just good on the podcast. Just a minute. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, we're all for a bit, a bit of balance on the programme, and he's not here to defend himself. But you have just, Henry, put yourself in the position of opening your contribution by claiming you weren't posh and closing it by revealing that you went to Eton. <laughs> I didn't go to Eton. Actually, I went to prep school with him. Well, that's not dragon. much better, old boy, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I was too stupid to get into Eton. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you're a Tory party member. Boom, boom. <laughs> it's 10.56. Steve's in Gravesend. Steve, what would you like to say? Uh, good morning, James. Hello, I, I wanted to answer your question um, about how people could still think it's a good idea to vote Conservative. I wasn't going to ask uh, I'm glad you're here and we haven't got long, but I was actually asking when will it be time to ask the question of how anyone can still support this lot. But oh, sorry, no, but no, it's no, I'm glad you're here. Go on, fill your boots. Uh, yeah, so so my, but the, 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 I'll try and make this quick. Yeah. Um, during the uh, during the run up to Brexit, I was I was really undecided, and then I started seeing this uh, woman who was a human rights lawyer, okay. and she explained to me a lot about what was being said, and I started to get interested and started to realise this is all rubbish. This, 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 these promises can't can't true. They're rubbish. Mm. Um, so that kind of made me think back, looking at the situation now. I didn't know. I had no idea about all this. So I accepted it more or less on face value. Yeah. Um, now I can I can look back and go it was rubbish. So I can put myself in a position where people who perhaps don't have exposure yeah. to information might think, oh, you know, they're not doing a bad job. Blah 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 blah. Or Labour will media, be worse. Is is probably all well, they've got left. Really, Labour will be even worse. However bad it gets, someone will always stand up and say Labour will be even worse. There's always got to be a bogeyman, isn't there? Mm. So it so, is. I mean, um, it's very hard to climb down. Is, did the relate? Sorry to be nosy, but I'm. You know what I'm like, Steve. Did the relationship survive? 
Um, well, we're friends still. Okay, so no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, well, actually, she's done you a grave service, hasn't she? She's done you a good service there. And, well, no, no, she, she's, uh, yeah, she's very clever. Showing you the light. I like that. And, and I guess it is. I mean, it, it is just that weird little opportunity, that chance encounter that made you look at the world in a slightly different way. And if you never have that chance encounter, why would you ever start looking at the world in a slightly different way? And the minute you do, particularly on this Rwandan thing, unless you share the impulse to repel all foreigners, unless you share the resentment of the existence of all foreigners on these islands, then I don't think you can still be going along with it. And that means that you've got about 10 to 20% of the electorate that are currently receiving all of the attention from the Parliamentary Conservative Party. And a tragedy of Sunak's position, if, if that's not too generous a term, is I don't actually think he is that kind of conservative. Uh, I, you, you get onto fairly thin ice when you start talking about the, or you start questioning the attitudes of the children of migrants to modern migrants. Um, there are questions there, but they, you have to be very careful how you ask them. But I don't think Sunak sits with uh, colleagues like Priti Patel or Suella Braverman on, on the, the relish for the performative denigration of people trying to come here to make a better life. I really don't, but I think he's ended up leading a party where it's an absolute prerequisite of promotion to at least appear or stay silent when other people express that position. Thank you, Steve. Um, sorry for being so nosy, mate. None of my business. You didn't have to answer me. But um, I don't think anyone rings in not knowing what to expect these days. A bit of a change in the next hour, I think. At the moment, I'm minded to have a look at the cost of funerals, and I shall tell you why after this. James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after 11 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, will be taking your calls on this show on LBC on Friday. You can get your questions in early by heading to lbc.co.uk forward slash question and submitting your inquiry via the online form. And either you can book a berth on the buzzing switchboard, or you can submit the question, and I will be your vessel. I will ask it on your behalf. I think this hour, uh, PMQ is coming up at 12. Natasha will join us shortly before that to have a look at what is and what is not likely to unfold. He didn't go near Rwanda last week, did he, Keir Starmer? I don't think. I'm minded to play you the shortlist of the smear Keir Sting, You'll remember that I came up with another brilliant idea um, on the show, presuming that management would move heaven and earth to provide me with what we call uh, furniture on the radio. Is that the right word? Furniture, like uh, sound effects? Like, okay, smear Kia, which is going to pinpoint examples of the client media, the Tory client media, pretending that um, Keir Starmer has done something egregious when really he's done something utterly, utterly uh, blameless or at the very least mildly irritating. And, and I came up with the idea, and I expected some production or, or, or some sound effects or a sting and nothing, absolutely nothing. <sighs> it's not as if it's my 20th anniversary on the station that's going completely unremarked at the same time as they make a massive fuss about other people either, is it? It's all, it's all fine, fine, fine by me. So I asked you to come up with it, and we got, I think, 30 in the end, uh, nine of which were so rubbish they didn't even get on air, and 21 of which we played out earlier in the week, and six of those, someone stopped me in the street yesterday and said, it's got to be number eight, which was Tim's effort, and it might also be my favourite, but don't let that influence your decision. Um, we've got six entries to play you, a short list of six, which I will play you shortly, and uh, and then that will that will choose the winner, and then... In the finest tradition of features and brilliant ideas on this program, we'll probably forget all about it and never play it again. But ideally, we'll remember, because there'll be something in the newspapers in the run-up to the election, which sees the Telegraph or, 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 the, um, or the Mail desperately trying to smear Kia, and we'll not only draw your attention to the story or draw each other's attention to the story, because your suggestions are always welcome. In fact, they're kind of essential. But we'll also uh, augment it with a bespoke listener-made sting okay six minutes after 11 is the time now i we, we've done this story i think twice before which considering i've been here for 20 years is not that often is it and it is a story um that i can now do with a modicum of humor but i think when i first did it with you i couldn't 
Because when I first did it with you, I was talking about my dad. I was talking about my late dad and my introduction to the world of funerals, which I think anybody who's been through it, and I, and, and, and I know that not everybody has. I mean, the, having the responsibility of organizing it, not just going to one, um, it, it's, it's a surreal experience. It's, it, it, well, look, if you're in the immediate period of grief after losing someone you really love, someone to whom you were so close that you are charged in part or entirely with organizing the funeral, then you are in a completely surreal position anyway, aren't you? Even, even if you've lost a close friend, as I, as I did a couple of weeks ago and whose funeral I attended on Friday, it's, you don't quite, it doesn't quite feel real. You, you know what I'm talking about. You're in that, it's almost like a sort of emotional liminal space you're, 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 it feels like a sort of combination of a hangover, except you're not in pain. And, uh, and, and uh, I don't know, it's, I, I, it's, it's hard to pinpoint, isn't it? You keep expecting someone to say it's not happened, it's not real. But you're there. It's the permanence of loss that I think is so uh, profound. It's the permanence of loss. Most things that you go through, there is light at the end of the tunnel. But with bereavement, there is not. There is just the, the, the slow grope towards a place where you're not as devastated as you were in the first moments, the first days, the first weeks. A slow grope. They talk about the stages of grief, don't they? Um, so that's part of the reason why everything is surreal. And then you come to the, the logistics of it, if you like. And that was the bit where I I couldn't quite get my head around stuff you know no one i presume has to do this very often do they it's going to be your parents or a partner or god forbid a child but but very few people are going to have a regular responsibility to organize the financial side of a funeral and you, you've got absolutely no idea like you can't really shop around i don't think Quite often, the body of your loved one has been taken to an undertaker, I th presume because of contracts with health authorities or hospitals. I don't know how that works, but it's already there. And to say, well, I, I've, there's someone cheap around the corner, or there's someone... I, I. So you're in this almost unique position as a customer, as a consumer, where you have no power. And this isn't a criticism of undertakers, not yet, or funeral directors. Um, you, you, you sit there, you sit in a room, and you, you are shown catalogues, which, if memory serves, and it's, it's 12 years since I had to do it, and please God, it's a good few years before I have to do it again. But if memory serves, these, are, these, these catalogues run quite the gamut from the cheapest to the most expensive option. And then I don't know whether you're built like this. I kind of hope you're not. And I, do you know what? I don't know that I am anymore. But 12 years ago, I still was a bit chippy. You know, I want the best for my dad. And then I hear my dad's voice in my head, his Yorkshire accent, <laughs> saying, do I spend that on a coffin? <laughs> Finding the idea ridiculous of me spending extra on bloody knobs. For the, for the coffer. But, but then there's the other bit of me that says, I want you to go out in style, Dad. I want you to have the best there is. I want you to have blinking horses going up the road. With a, with a, and, and, and you're in that mad space, that crazy space, where you really don't know whether you're coming or going. A couple of stories in the news today. Um, I presume that they spring from the same source, but they are handled as you'd expect, considering that one's in the Mail and one's in the Guardian. They're, they're, they're handled rather differently. The Guardian reports that, that paupers' funerals and direct cremations are on the rise, and also that growing numbers of grieving families are having to sell belongings, raid their savings, or borrow from friends to cover the cost of a loved one's funeral. This is a report from an insurance company that says the cost of dying has hit a record high. Right, pause. An insurance company is not going to release... An insurance company that sells funeral insurance is, is not going to commission a report that says, don't worry about your funerals, you certainly don't need insurance. Any more than an anonymous billionaire is going to commission polling for the Daily Telegraph uh, that doesn't conclude that they need to lurch further to the right in order to... Uh, 
uh, well, uh, keep anonymous billionaires in the habit of commissioning polling and donating to think tanks happy. So, uh, you know, I, I am aware of that. Don't waste tuppence telling me. But the numbers are irrefutable. So a basic funeral in 2004 cost £1,835. The 20-year period since has seen a rise of 126%. Now, if it had gone up in line with consumer price inflation, it would have gone up by 72%. So that is a huge disparity. And it means that the cost of dying, which will include burial or cremation fees, but also funeral director's costs, a mid-range coffin, one funeral limousine, a doctor and a celebrant, as well as estate administration fees. The cost of dying is now just shy of £10,000, £9,658. And the... I mean, I, 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 I can't win some days with you, you know. So if I say I, I am happily, at the moment, not badly off, I'll get half a dozen texts accusing me of boasting or constantly going on about how, how rich I am. But if I don't mention it, I'll get half a dozen texts saying, well, it's all right for you, isn't it? You can afford to pay it. So I always veer on the side of honesty and openness. So I will say, that's a sum of money. God forbid I have to, but I could afford. I, you know, I wouldn't have to sell anything. But it, if you acknowledge that, I mean, the percentage of people in this country who haven't got £100 in savings, then... The difficulty of, well, you know that it's going to be impossible to find £10,000 for a funeral. So what do you do? There will be people, and I don't want to be, I don't want to be insensitive, but there will be people in this story who are the equivalent of the people we talk to who can't quite believe that they're never going to be able to afford a house. There'll be people who've buried relatives who cannot quite believe that they ended up being a family that couldn't afford a funeral and had a, had a, what is still called, I think probably unhelpfully, a, a pauper's funeral or a direct cremation. And given that impulse I described a moment ago about wanting the best for your loved ones, that must be very difficult to deal with. I, I mean, as, as, as a comfort, I, I would say to you that it is, um, uh, uh, it's a pointless impulse. No one's going to know, you know, and even if there is an afterlife, no one's going to look down from heaven or even less likely look up from hell and get cross with you for not paying extra for gold knobs on their coffin, are they? I don't think. Although you know your loved ones better than I do. But it's, it is a pointless impulse. It's a, it's, a, it's a you problem, not a them problem, is how the kids would put it. But you can't, and, and this is going to sound a little bit inappropriate in the context, which is what I meant by having lived enough life since my dad died to, to see the funny side now you can't haggle maybe you should haggle but you can't you can't say what's your best offer to a funeral director can you did you oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three you can't i mean see, that seems a bit steep i'm sure we could come to some arrangement is there a discount for cash i, I don't know why it's a victorian thing right we're weird about death in this country I'm not a great haggler anyway. I've got a godson that could haggle the hind legs off a donkey. I took him to Camden Market once and I thought, I, I, and he bought a jacket. And I thought to myself, I should have had you with me when I bought my last house. He was, he was, he did the whole thing. He did the walking away. He did, I'm not interested. He goes, the fella up the road's doing it for 60. It, it was absolutely extraordinary. I think he got more than 50% knocked off the price of a jacket. I had no clue that the prices were so arbitrary. I'm very naive, as you've probably established over the years. But I don't think you'd do it at a funeral director's, would you? There's a lot going on here. Some of it, of course, demands great sensitivity. In the first instance, I don't want to talk to funeral directors, all right? In the very first instance, I want to talk to customers. We will talk to funeral directors, but in the first instance, I don't want to talk to funeral directors because I want to talk about it from a consumer's or a customer's point of view. And I want to know, essentially how you coped with the cost of funerals, which means you are really only going to have something interesting to say if it was not easy, if you struggled. I know that... Oh, I make no apology for asking whether or not you haggled, whether or not you actually drove the price down. You'll make me feel a bit silly if you did, because I didn't. 
but it would be helpful to others who may have to face this horror show in the coming months or years to learn from your experience. Did you have to did you have to downgrade your expectations? That must have been difficult. So what was your experience of the rocketing cost of funerals? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need so that 10 grand is an average you, you don't need a funeral limousine there's a couple of other things you don't need i like this from eric not least because he manages to get a gag halfway through he says unfortunately we had to bury my dad last november the whole thing including the wake and food for 40 people was about five grand james well five thousand three hundred in the end because i forgot to close the tab at the bar it wasn't lavish but it certainly wasn't cheap either so you know it, the, the number is an average attached to some research but equally five grand's a heck of a lot of money isn't it i mean where are you going to find five grand if you can't find money for a new boiler or you can't find money for a new car the, the percentage of the population that has less than 100 pounds in savings is criminally high it's so high in fact that i keep blocking it out mentally i'll check during the break and get you the figure but what do you do what did you do and, and what can you do to, to keep costs down? I think that's an important question, albeit a potentially quite mawkish one. If you hit the numbers now, you will get, th well, you, you should get through. 0345 6060 It's 1118. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 21 minutes after 11. <laughs> I don't know if this one will get on air, Ian, on Friday when uh, the Mayor of London is on the show. But he's written from Yorkshire. Um, I've got a question for Sadiq Khan James on Friday. Have you ever had your pocket picked on the tube or your wallet stolen? I, that's a good question. That I might, I might ask him that. It might be a bit dated, but we shall see. UK faces a cost of dying crisis. Oh, Christ, it's all, you've heard it all now, haven't you? Cost of living crisis coming out of our ears and now a cost of dying crisis. But, but there it is. And what, I wonder, what has happened to you and what can other people do about it? Mark's in Milton Keynes to, to kick things off. Mark, what would you like to say? James, my, my ears pricked up on this subject because yes. it, took, it took me back to 2017 when we lost my, my late mother. And my, I've lost my father since, but my, my late yeah. father at the time, we were, we were phoning around talking to, uh, you know, uh, talking to the funeral director. And my mother had died in hospital and needed to be collected and usual sort of thing. And we got a price, and uh, this this sort of learned person talking to us, and about yes. you know uh, we, going into the upsell, and you know if you really almost inferring if you really cared, you'd do this and that. Do you, do you, are we confident that that's what they're doing? It is, isn't it? it uh, otherwise, yes. otherwise, they wouldn't have like such a. Sorry, I've, I've been in sales for thirty years. So you know, you know it when you see it. You know it when you see it. Yeah, it was nicely done. It was sure. very respectful, but it was a sales pitch. Yeah. And my late father, who was a serial negotiator, said to me, "This, this is." He said, "He said, he said, this is." The, so I'm not having this. Yeah. I said, "What do you mean, Dad?" He said, "He said we're going to shop around some." And uh, he, I like him already. Yeah, oh, he was wonderful. <laughs> we so we don't try and sell him oranges and apples again on a, from a market store. Yeah. That, that was the trouble. Yeah. Anyway, so we so we shopped around. And it was utterly remarkable, God. the price difference. Really? The price difference, it went from five or six thousand pounds. And in the end, we found this firm, father and son business, they got into it and they were quite honest. They said, we thought it was a, an interesting career to get into. We yes. set up a business and they were doing perfectly decent, same sort of service for, for, for about 1,500 quid. Really? So, yeah. And, and then, then to add to add. Add to, to, to end the story, we, we then wanted to bury my mother in near, near our original hometown. We went to the parish council, the, the town council, whoever you speak to, yeah. got a got a price for a grave in the churchyard in the in the in the cemetery, and it was about three thousand pounds. We thought, well, this is ridiculous. And then again, my father sweet says, "We said, well, how can this?" So he got on the phone. He phoned around. He, he spoke to the parish council of a village half a mile away from the cemetery, right. and they said, "Oh no, no, to bury in the churchyard here, it's it's just under a thousand pounds." So, so we so we saved uh, you know an awful lot of money, which is what you don't want to be spending at the best of times. But the thing, I suppose, the last my last point is. What, what I, what, you know, okay, I, I was lucky, I suppose, in terms of our attitude and our ability to deal with it. But the, the yeah. average person, I think they'd be, they'd just roll with it. Yes. They'd be in grief. 
they, people would put pressure on them. They go, well, that's what we ought to do. It's yes. a death. You know, yes. th- th- this isn't a commercial enterprise. These people would care for us. And, and goodness knows how, how many thousands get lost. And then you, 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 sorry, lastly, lastly, you reflect on the fact that most what you think of private funeral homes in this country are actually owned by the Cooperative Funeral Service. So it's one of the biggest cartels in Great Britain. Uh, and um, even, even though it says Dombey and Sons outside. The, the, they were the, bought out in the, the 50s. The, the, yes, and I think actually since then, I think there's been a big American operator moving into the market as well, which also owns a significant swathe of apparently independent operators. So they'll all be singing yeah. from, if you pardon the pun, they'll all be singing from the same hymn sheet. Yeah. What, 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 did, was it a nice send-off? Oh, we had, yes, of course it was. Yes. Um, we, we did it well. We had a, a small sort of after after lunch at a, a room in a, in a golf club yes. and, you know, friends and family got together and we, we did what we all do at Wakes, you know, and yes. had happy memories of my mum. But the point is, at least it didn't cost a blinking fortune. Well, the, yeah, the point is it is like a lot of other services because it is a service, isn't it? There's, I mean, I know there are raw materials involved in, to, yeah. to an extent, but generally speaking, it's... It's labour that you're paying for, or time, human time, and and oh, therefore, yes. therefore, there is. I, I, I so what? I mean, from f- roughly speaking, what was the what was the highest quote you got, and what was the lowest? I know what the we lowest. Put, we well, we put a spreadsheet together. It could have been done for about twelve grand, and you, you and know, instead and that, that it went for fifteen hundred. Yeah, you've got to, you've got to add on the, the burial of a thousand pounds, so yeah. two and a half thousand pounds. Good you know, plus, plus a few drinks. Yes, and of course, afterwards. of course. But but you're looking but, at twenty percent, twenty five percent of what what yeah. you would have been quoted otherwise. It's shocking, and I, I just, I just, I, I, it's so sad. And I just hope that people in similar circumstances have got the the energy or the wherewithal to to, oh, to get on the phone. That's a lovely choice of words. Then I was wondering what words you were going to use because I was actually going to ask you what advice you would give to someone. And I don't need to imagine an example. I can use myself. What and I, you know, I'm obviously good at talking, but um, but not at not at negotiating. Uh, what what yeah. advice would you give to someone like me who finds the idea of of shopping around or haggling a little bit distasteful? Well, that's that's part of the British culture, isn't it? Yes. I, I think I think you just have to say, what's the worst thing that can happen when you pick up the phone and ask for a better price? The worst thing can happen is they'll say no. It's not. No one's going to die. <laughs> um, I know, in the circumstances, I do apologise for that. But you know what I mean. You don't have to apologise. I thought it was. Deli- I thought it was deliberate. Yes. Well. Yeah. I don't, not, not, it was, it, but it's not a matter of life and death. No. The one to well, say, no. That, that would have been a less felicitous <laughs> turn of phrase, wouldn't it? But no. I mean, that's great. I love that, Mark. Thank you, and cre- credit to, to, to your late father as well for having taught you these lessons. Um, what's the worst that can happen and to be fair that that before all the phone calls in your life that you've been frightened of making that that is quite a good question to what's the worst that can happen she says no she doesn't want to go to the cinema with you i used to be terrible i am a 1980s kid i mean so i used to ring you see the old dial phones you get to the last number I, I can't do it hang up can't do it but you know you're phoning up to books some people are just i've got i wouldn't say it's a phobia i'm just not very good at it i know what you're thinking a radio phony knows who doesn't like making phone calls but I, but there it is um that's why i need you to ring me uh dorrit is in broccoli dorrit what would you like to say yeah um yeah the cost of funerals uh, um it wasn't so much the funeral that cost an awful lot of money for my late father who died just over two years ago now yeah. it was actually getting the local borough to prepare the ground um you know to, uh, put it to dig yes. a hole in the ground which is not yours forever and ever it's i think it's 25 years well, what happens uh, after that well i'm not sure but that costs more than the actual funeral so how much um, was the how much was the the, the, the plot the, to, for the for the plot for the, to dig a hole in the ground was five thousand pounds, and that was just <laughs> and that was more than the actual funeral. I mean, and you funeral did it. Itself, you found you found the money, did you? Yeah, yeah. Luckily. But what yeah, did you think did. when you heard Mark say that when his dad rang up the next <laughs> parish along, they got it for a fraction of the price? I, I don't know how he did that. And also, when you're in, you know, you just lost somebody, yeah. uh, you know, in my case, my father, you know, you aren't in the mood to be phoning around and stuff like that. And I think in London, it's kind of different. You have to bury them in the borough that they, they lived in or died in. You know, you don't have a choice, really. I didn't know that. And, oh, yeah, and if I, wanted him to bur- if I wanted to bury him in a different borough, that would cost probably double the amount. But um, as I say, to prepare the ground... 
um, in, in, in the cemetery. It was £5,000. And as I say, it's not yours forever and ever. I think, if I remember rightly, if I look in the paperwork, it's for 25 years. I don't get that. Uh, what do you, I mean, I, I, love, I don't want to think about it, to be honest with you, Dorrit. I don't know what happens after that. You know, perhaps they write to you and say, do you still want this? I, re- I really don't know what they do. Well, someone listening it, will know, won't they? Yeah, yeah, but I think it's 25 years. Okay. Uh, my father's plot is room for two. So, oh, that's nice. So, you know, yeah. Well, why, yeah. why, why, I, I mean, I, I think you're right, and you reflect my own feelings in a way but i was quite mm. i was quite inspired by mark's story about yeah uh, yeah it, that turning around yes yeah i mean i mean i'd say the funeral itself um i went to the, there's um I, I went to a particular um funeral director who uh, recommended by people i know okay. and they did a really good funeral and we had a couple of cars and um they they walked from the house from the place to the actual church where the ceremony took place and all that it was really done really well you know pleased with that if you like or yes. we were pleased because i've got siblings as well well, that, well that's but important I yeah i just couldn't believe the cost of the actual preparing the ground you know that was just as i said just a bit more than the actual funeral itself well and that, that's and that's going cost. to the council that's that's a, that's a, that's, a, that's a, i presume it is although actually these days it's probably it might be privatized i don't know dorit thank you just gone half past 11 you're listening to james o'brien on lbc and thomas watts how's your headline james o'brien on lbc <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.34. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, Jolly and Morm of the Good Law Project pointed out, uh, keep an eye on how newspapers um, work with politicians at the moment, is sometimes to mislead the British public. On Monday, the Times was reporting that the Rwanda bill meets our international law obligations. Now reality has caught up with it. And the Times has been told that the Attorney General and the Minister for Illegal Immigration and the government's own lawyers all all, um, uh, consider that ignoring a Rule 39 order would be a breach of international law, which, um, uh, well, there you go. At least they're dealing with all the important stuff. These politicians, 11.35 is the time. I'm going to read this in its entirety. I don't know that there's a great deal to learn from it, but I, I, I want to send my love to Carl and yours on, on, on your behalf and just use it as an illustration of the story that we're currently discussing. Hi, James. I'm in a hospital waiting room at the moment, and this is a, a live issue for me. I bur- buried my mum five years ago and my dad ten years ago. With dad, it was exactly as you described. We rocked up at the funeral directors who had collected the body. I'm still not sure how that happened. And we were bewildered by the brochures. Mum, like your godson, said, this is how much we have, £3,000. What can we get for it? And she stuck to her guns on what she would spend. Um, she then planned her own funeral and put aside the money. Um, When it came down to it, the actual costs were more and it fell to me to negotiate and end up and finding the extra costs of about £2,000. My sisters all wanted the very best for her, but I knew she'd hate that. So we argued a lot, especially because I was the one putting all the excess on my credit card. I now have an elderly brother who has nothing and is about to die. I'm currently ringing around funeral directors to see who can do it cheapest and we will probably have to go for a direct cremation um, and a service at the church because I can't afford to pay for the whole thing. It's ridiculous to be in this situation, but what can we do? I I don't know. I'm not in any position whatsoever to advise you, but you're looking after him and you're there for him. And that's a hell of a lot more important than the the veneer on his coffin or or the, or the, or the quality of canapes at his send off, mate. You're, You're there for him. You're being a good brother, regardless of what you have and haven't got in your bank account. 11.37 is the time. James is in Camden. James, what, what made you pick up the phone? Oh, a big story of death, James. Good morning. Um, just quickly, before I tell my story, for the chap, uh, Cole, um, I don't know his situation, but I do know from first-hand experience that if he's on perhaps universal credit or some sort of benefit like that, he said his brother was elderly, so I don't know, he might be of a certain age yeah. himself, there is support available. If you talk to any good funeral director worth their sort, they will okay. give you the forms to fill in. And there is there is government support that you can get, so it is there, um, because, you know, we discussed it when, when I had to go through my experience, which yeah. was... Um, we lost our, uh, our dad um, literally just over a year ago. The anniversary was Friday last week. Um, 
So he passed away. Um, I emptied pretty much all of my savings to pay for his funeral because, you know, we just wanted to just get it done and everything yeah. else. And we didn't really haggle or anything. And to be fair, the we need a better word. I like negotiate. Ha- negotiate ha- it's yeah. weird, isn't it? Haggle sounds oh, as if you're buying a, I don't know, a car, but negotiate is, is nicer. Yeah. So I emptied my, my savings, which is about six grand. That's all I had paid yeah. for his funeral. I was very lucky. Um, because we found out by going through some mail that he had a life insurance policy that we didn't know about. Right. Um, which then paid for the funeral of his sister, who died subsequently a few weeks after him. Okay. And then also my grandmother, who passed away in November, who was their mother. Um, so I've lost oh. essentially half of my family. And yeah. funeral costs over the last year, including things like, you know, paying for drinks at a wake and, yes, yes. you know, ta- taxis for, for family members who couldn't get about and stuff, it's cost me well over 20 grand. Which you didn't have which I didn't have. And to be honest, it would have been nice to have cashed in my dad's life insurance policy and not had to have spunked it all on funerals. Yes, but course. there we are. Them's the breaks, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, um, it's just, it's it's wild. And I never... What did you think, think when you heard callers reporting on having shopped around a bit? Um, I thought, uh, first of all, I wish, I wish I'd done it. Yeah. But also, I kind of wish I'd had the... You just, you're not in that set, set sense of mind. I know you talk about your old man going no, you know, a few years it's back. the last and, thing on your mind. But I, I, yeah. this, this conversation might help a few people just to think, well, why wouldn't I? Yeah, you know, another, another Someone else with a background in sales has been in touch and just said, there's only three things that can happen when you make that phone call. It's, it's yes, no, or maybe. Yeah. That's it, isn't it? That's when you ask that question, it's yes, no, or maybe. So did you get into debt yourself or did you sell stuff? Um, I ended up to get um, the money back for my dad's funeral. I sold his car, but that was only about 4000 So it was basically £2,000 out of my own money. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as I say, we, we found some stuff going through his mail. I'm currently trying to... Well, there's a lesson to- there, mate, James, isn't there? So, you, you know, anybody listening to this who's got life insurance needs to be 100% sure that your loved ones know about it. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Because yeah, they might insane. not, you know. It's a, it probably will, but if you've lost your partner and you're still there, they, then the, the, the kids might not know or the nephew might, or whoever it's going to fall to needs to know exactly what you've got in place, I think. Yeah, it's it's only digging through my grandmother's bank statements that I found out that she also has one that should just about cover the cost that we had to shell out for hers, but I've go. got to go through litigation and probate and stuff to get hold of all of that. So oh, it's no, a, and there's another and that, nightmare. There's a cost. Yeah, so and that's unpaid. And, yeah, solicitors of course. and stuff. It's insane. So. Well, I wish you well, yeah. uh, and thank Cheers, you man. for sharing because that, that, that you know it's all helpful, isn't it? You're probably less equipped. So the first time you do this, you're probably the one of the biggest tasks with the least equipment or qualification that you will ever have to face in your life, isn't it? And and yet here we are being all English and Victorian about it. You're right, that, that David Bowie did have a straight to crematorium. <laughs> Um, uh, and, uh, uh, the, the, you know, and, and he had time to prepare for his passing as well. But he, I looked that up because the producer mentioned it earlier. There's lots and lots of different things you can do. But, of course, we prefer not to think about it. I, I don't know whether 50 is the point where you start feeling really mortal. But you prefer not to think about it. And we probably should think about it a lot more. A lot more. 11.41 is the time. Joanna is in Cardiff. Joanna, what made you pick up the phone? Um, so my husband died very suddenly 10 years ago when oh. my children were very young. They oh. were 7 and 10. Right. Um, and at the time, to- um, actually, we did end up having enough money. But of course, when he died, I didn't know that. And actually, I was thinking about what your other caller just said. I had forgotten that we had life insurance. There you and go. We were paying it. Gosh. Because, I mean, I just never thought that was going to happen, did I? No. So when it... So at the obvious, when the time when I was organising the funeral, I didn't know if I would have money. I never, it never occurred to me to haggle or anything like that. But what did happen was that parents from my children's school made all the food for the wake. Um, and oh. I remember being kind of, but I was embarrassed Why? about that because I think there'd been this massive tragedy and I wanted to show the world that despite this, I could cope. You know, I didn't want to yeah. be a figure of people feeling sorry for me Gosh. so um but the we're food, a funny old honestly, species we're a funny old species aren't we Joanna? i know <laughs> and the food you know what it was amazing yeah. as in it was i could not you could not have got a better you know um yeah, you know, a, a better food at a wake it was fantastic and they organized it all to be honest i can't remember quite a lot of it no, you know because i think i was in a of course in you a bad were. way of course, yeah. And was the insurance attached? Was it linked to the mortgage? Was it? 
Yes. Because that... And again, at the time when he actually died, I didn't know that. No. So I was, we were going to have to move. And God, you thought you'd even and lose the time. house. Yeah. Well, oh. I thought, I mean, we didn't. It no, was, I know it you was didn't. Okay. But, but that's, I mean, you're dealing with grief and then you're dealing with disruption, aren't you? Or, or, or even thinking about potential disruption. Yeah. And I think when someone dies suddenly, the, um, you know, obviously it takes time for all this money to come through. Yes. So, and, you know, you don't really know. Um, and, and you're just in a, you know, I think, you're in I think a you, you, day yourself. Yeah. And you remind us that when it's a bolt from the blue, it's a completely different proposition to, you know, w w when you get a sort of long period of preparation and expectation, whether it's old age or illness, you, you kind of know it's going to happen yeah. sooner yeah, rather than later. Right. But you get, you get the, um, crikey. So, so, so actually in a way your outcomes were about as good as anyone could hope for in such horrible circumstances. I do. I remember the whole time I've always thought, well, there's somebody like me who hasn't got the money, you know, who's yeah. had all the yeah. same yeah. things, but without the money. And whatever anyone <sighs> says, everything is better with money. <laughs> hey, well, it is. It's choices. I mean, I always say that. People say it doesn't make you happy. Maybe not, but it gives you choices and choices make life easier. The more choices you've got in many ways, the easier your life is. Although I, I guess at this point I should acknowledge that I really hate enormous menus. Uh, I, I find them unbearable. There's too much to choose from. I find it almost impossible to decide on what I want. And then when I do decide on what I want, I almost immediately find myself wishing that I'd ordered something else after seeing it arrive at the next table. This is quite important from David, who is a trustee of a charity called It's Time, uh, who focus on helping 16 to 30-year-olds who experience parental loss. Their research suggests that's about 15% of young adults aged between 16 and 30. And when a single young adult loses one or both parents, um, who pays for this? Probate, access to money, etc., all sorts of issues. Um, and he writes, I was 18 when we buried my father, um, but who we lost to medical negligence. But I think this is an interesting point. Young adults who have to pay for funerals. You're absolutely right. And, and I'm glad that we now know about the It's Time charity. It's 11.45. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.48. I'll read this from Liz, who's in Carmarthenshire. She writes, I just wanted to get in touch to let you know that you can save a lot of money by doing a lot of it yourself. My dad's funeral a couple of years ago, I conducted the service. I picked the flowers out of his garden, because he was a keen gardener, and made the bouquet myself, printed, wrote, and designed the order of service. I even composed and sang some of the music that we played at the service, although not live. It saved a lot of money, and more importantly, it was beautiful and personal. Additionally, the DWP do have a phone number um, that many people on pension credit or benefits can use to get a lot of help. Mum ended up paying just a few hundred pounds. So there had been some solid advice today which was the point of the conversation and and there are funeral directors who who do provide a a, 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 a more reasonably priced service without any apparent diminution in 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 quality or or provision um i want to do something completely different before pmqs um uh, so i don't know that i'll have time to take any more calls on this for which i apologize because obviously you're ringing in with quite personal stuff but but whatever i do next there's going to be a lot of people left um waiting and we've got pmqs coming up at 12 so I'm, i need a final decision from you on which sting we're going to use for our almost soon certain to be forgotten smear care feature i'm going to do my best not to forget it every year i do little things designed to improve the program and this year it's post-it notes i'm going to put post-it notes on the screen in front of me to remind me of stuff uh, I've tried, no, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking colleagues. I've tried that. I've tried asking colleagues to remind me of stuff that's important to me as the presenter of the programme, but it, 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 psh, weeing in the wind. So I've, I've got post-it notes. I'm going to write stuff like smear Kier on a post-it note and stick it on the screen and then hopefully remember to do a smear Kier in the course of the programme. But I've remembered to do this, which is a good sign for 2024. It started well. I've remembered to do this. I could have easily played out 21 stings earlier this week and then forgotten all about it and never come back to it again. And then in about June, I'd just go, oh, what happened to that smear? And then I'd try and blame it on someone else when it was all entirely my fault. Uh, so these are the six remaining. I think we call, do we call them one to six? Or do we leave them with their original numbers? Can someone make it? We leave them with the original numbers. All right. Could we not have relabeled them one to six? Would that not have made more sense than leaving them with their original? 
Yeah, right, I'll deal, I'll deal with it. So we're going to leave them with their original numbers, even though there's only six of them. So the first one you'll hear is number three, and the last one you'll hear is number 21, even though there's only six of them, right? Yeah, okay, fine, no problem at all. So the first entrant for the Smear Kia Sting is from Bob, and it is, and, and you just need to text the number that you like to 84850, or you... Uh, tweet at LBC. Don't tweet my personal account. It gets too busy. So so there it is. You need to either text to 84850 or tweet to at LBC the number of the sting that you want to become the permanent feature on the programme. We begin with number three. Three. Number three. Bob. Smear kill. It's good, that, isn't it? No, I like that one. Uh, that was number three, Bob. Uh, the next entry is number eight. Number eight from Tim. Mr. Speaker, that's simply what they, they, Yeah, and I believe in velvet socialism. For and I'll come to the leader of the opposition. Both of Donkey Fees. Smear Kier with James O'Brien. That's quite long, but not bad at all. You can see why these got through, can't you? This is going to be a lot harder than making the original decision. Uh, now, the third entry, which is number ten, logically... Number 10 from Adrian. Smear. Here. Is that drum and bass or jungle? Or neither? It's neither. It's nowhere near enough BPM, was there? I can't play any again. That was number 10 from Adrian. And number 11, 11 from Aiden. Smear. Kia. That was number 11. Next, number 14. That's 14 from Mo. That was number 14 from Mo. And finally, it's number 21. That's 21 from Simon. Smear Kier. Oh, this is bad, man. I've got a favourite. I've got a f- Have you got a favourite? Which one is your favourite? Have you got... Yeah. yeah. I'm going to play them all again, and then you can... Well, you can start voting already. So it's number 3, 8, 10, 11, 14, or 21. Here is number 3. Smear kill. Here is number 8. Mr Speaker, that's simply what... Yeah, and I believe in velvet socialism. And I'll come to the leader of the opposition of Donkey Fees. Smear Kier with James O'Brien. Here is number 10. Smear. Kier. Number 11. Smear Kier. 14. Smear Kier. Smear Kier. And finally, number 21. Smear Kier. And that concludes the entrance for this year's Smear Kier competition. I'm not announcing the winner on on the show because we're going to count them properly this time. (gasps) I can't believe I said this time out loud. (laughs) We're going to count them properly. I've got quite a a clear favourite. If I tell you what my clear favourite is, will you vote against it or for it? You're going to ruin it for me, aren't you? I, I've got a really clear favourite now. Oh, no, I was not expecting that to happen. And it's not, I don't, oh, no. It's, I, I've got a clear favourite and I'm not sure it's the one I thought it was going to be. But if I tell you which one it is, it, it, that's unfair, right? That would. That's not allowed. But I, I invented it. Why can't I? Oh. Well, keep the, keep the votes coming in on that. And I will reveal which one my favourite was, um, although it doesn't currently seem to be in the lead. Natasha Clark is here, LBC's political editor. Um, apologies to everybody, to Andrew, to Jimmy and to others waiting to talk about this funeral director's conversation, to which we will return, I promise you. I, I, I know I probably said that last time, but I was dealing with personal grief last time we talked about this, so it, it was a slightly different conversation. Now we're in the position of, of being able to help others facing a, 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 a remarkably difficult scenario. But um, some good advice, and if any more comes in, I'll share it in the... In the next hour, uh, after PMQs has concluded. So, 
no, no Rwanda at all last week, if memory serves, was there? Not no, there was. There, there was. was a mention of it, but there weren't questions. General general migration, I yeah. think it was last week. So what's he going to do this week? This is a circular firing squad now, the Rwanda bill, except they all keep missing each other. <laughs> I think he has to mention it, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, I would um, imagine so. Because we're, we're gearing up for yet another big day in the Commons and these more amendments being debated. And the final third reading of this vote, which is the last part of the Commons before it goes to the Lords will be later today. So Keir is definitely, I'm sure, going to mention it in some point. I think what if I were him, I would go for the idea that the Prime Minister is weak. Mm. We've heard Labour use that attack line before. It's come out on the calls a lot lately and uh, you can sometimes tell yeah. the direction of traffic from Exactly, that, and so. he can't control his party. You've got 58 Conservative MPs that you can't get on side. That's that's what I think he would mm. he would go with today. Um, I also wonder if he might use some of uh, Lee Anderson or Brendan Clark Smith's comments last night against him, <laughs> throw them back at him, saying, "Well, your deputy, your former deputy chair, has said this, 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 and he can't vote for it." Um, what you know? Why should any MP vote for this crazy plan? That's spot spot check. How many deputy chairmen of the Conservative Party are there at the moment? So there were, I think, twelve. Twelve. I think. It's like the disciples. Now we've got... Is this the last supper? Exactly. And now boom, we've boom. got two less. So we've only got ten. ten yeah. I think, I believe that's true. I Deputy, th- sure. Um, I thought they were 37. I don't think so. <laughs> so some of them were deputy chair. I think yeah. Lee Anderson was a deputy chair and I think Brandon Clark Smith was a vice why, chair. Natasha, why are they called the baked bean two? Because there's... The, I can't remember exactly the context of it, but there's this picture of Lee Anderson feeding... Brenda Clark Smith baked beans. You've not seen this picture. Sorry, what? Pardon. There's a picture Fe- which exists. Right. Why? Of I think there was it was something to do with Lee Anderson. Obviously, has been talking lots about how to f- feed your family for less money. Yeah. And I think it was to do with that, but I can't remember exactly the context. I'm sure our listeners will will tell me, um, and we can look it up very quickly in the break i'm sure but yes there's a, there's a picture which is now obviously being circulated around the internet following last night's vote of one of them feeding of baked Lee Anderson beans the other feeding one. baked beans to brendan clark smith um it's, well, it's, never... it's quite a funny picture actually i would uh, would par- recommend you look it up the party of winston churchill <laughs> it's all gone so wrong isn't it remarkable <laughs> what happened isn't it remarkable so uh, and of course what that does and starmer has picked up on this opportunity before it essentially puts the prime minister in the position of having to challenge what one of his own MPs has said rather than what Keir Starmer has said. So would the Prime Minister agree with the man that he appointed? Yes, and he probably won't. I, you know, in the past, Sir Keir Starmer has done this thing where he doesn't actually say, would you agree with your mm. former deputy chair? He just says, you know, he says the quote and goes, you know, does the Prime Minister think that? And we don't, mm. we, you know, it's the, we all know who he's talking about. We all know that he's trying to, to, to get him to Bait, be baited essentially yes. on what one he's of his not. own MPs has said um, but that's what I would go on if I were him or the idea that inflation which the Prime Minister obviously again, has talked it? about so much <laughs> it's now gone back up again <laughs> this is lovely Politi- I mean in terms of politicking because Sudak would be perfectly within his rights to say, well, it's got nothing to do with us. Can't say but that, he can't can say he? that because he's done 12 laps of honour exactly. over it coming down, which also had nothing to do with him. So that's a rather perfect moment, to yep. paraphrase Martine McCutcheon. Um, before we carry on with PMQ's analysis, um, the, the, what is going to happen with this bill? I think... It- I think the, today we'll probably see not much going on in yep. the House of Commons. And I think when it comes push comes to shove, if you were a Tory MP... Why would you vote down something that is the toughest, as the Prime Minister says, the toughest bit of legislation that the government have ever put forward? Yeah. Why would you vote it down? If you don't vote for this, it doesn't happen. Would you? Do they want to really want to kill the entire Rwanda plan? So the rebellion has been both pointless and stupid, and <laughs> deeply, your words, and, not and, mine. <laughs> well, of course, but, but deeply damaging to Starmer's or author, to Sunak's authority. It is. It's a huge bloody nose today. He's obviously hugely embarrassed by this huge show of support but would they really do they really want to bring this whole Rwanda problem down because just think about it if you're an MP what do you expect happens next what do you then think would happen the Prime Minister's not going to... It's going to keep... It's going to hang around until they're not in power anymore, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, for sure. And for nothing's sure. going to happen. But no there's no plan. No going to take off. Braverman's d- sick dreams are never going to come true. Dave Baines has sent me footage. It's not just a photograph, Natasha. It is. It's a whole video. There's a whole video. Thanks, Dave. Of one MP feeding baked beans to another. Has he explained the context of it? Uh, suggesting people try cheaper alternatives. There we go. Okay, I was right. Okay, so that's value, nice. It would be value beans. Yes, Tesco was, value was it beans. Jake Berry who discovered the existence of value? We're talking about the cost of living. 
living crisis. He thought this was advice for people who are struggling to feed their families. He said, did you know, did you, did you though, did you know they actually have value ranges in some supermarkets? Is he Prue son? I don't believe so. I thought one of them was. I get so confused. I really do. Speaking of confusion, how could anybody have thought that uh, an operation organised by Lee Anderson and Brendan Clark Smith would end well? I said the bean operation. Well, no, as in the whole rebellion. rebellion. Oh, okay. Well, sorry, hard to, hard to keep up with oh, well, which we're just? talking about. Yes, I know. Spinning plates. I think Lee Anderson's going to have a real... George Eustace recommended value brands. F- sorry. Sorry. Jake you've, Berry you've just said, get Jake another Berry. job. Just get another job. I think Lee Anderson's going to have uh, a bit of a decision Danny to Danny Kruger is Prue Leith's son. Got you. There I we think. go. Is he? Is he? Yes, thank you. One of them is. I know that, yeah... Proulief has done a lot of work with the Conservative yeah. Party uh, at least one previously of us in the past. At least one of us is paying attention. I didn't know that. I didn't Did know that. Not? No. That's why I win the pub quizzes. There you go. Well that's done. It. That's why I do. That's um, I, look, Lee Anderson's going to have a big choice to make today. Does he vote this whole thing down or not? Because if not, what's the point of resigning? Isn't he going to look very stupid if he doesn't vote against this at Sorry. the third reading? You're, you're suggesting that he doesn't already? That's... Look very stupid. Lee Anderson is worried about looking very stupid. I don't think he is, but he will look. Rarely, if he, if rarely he... have I heard a, a less sensible <laughs> observation you know, about the state of British. You know what I mean. <laughs> Lee Anderson is worried about looking a bit stupid. That's like me worried about looking a bit bald. I, I don't know. I have something spoken over which to him, I have so absolutely I no control. I'm bald. He's stupid. Uh, let's cross live to the House of Commons. Uh, can I send my best wishes to the Honourable Member and his father also and all those suffering in this way? Mr Speaker, I can't let today pass without saying how saddened I was by the tragic death of Bronson Battersby, aged just two, who died in heartbreaking circumstances in Skegness. I know that this House will join me in sending our deepest sympathies to his family. Mr Speaker, the Government has been forced to admit that it has lost contact with 85% of the 5,000 people earmarked for removal to Rwanda. Has he found them yet? <laughs> Prime Minister. Mr. Mr Speaker, what I can tell the Honourable Gentleman is that in spite of him blocking every, in spite of him blocking every single attempt that we have taken, we have managed now, because of our actions, to reduce the number of people coming here by over a third last year, remove over 20,000 people from this country back to their home countries, carried out 70% more illegal enforcement raids, arrested hundreds of people, closed down thousands of bank accounts, and processed over 100,000 cases, the biggest number in over 20 years, Mr Speaker. That's because on this side of the House, we want to stop the boats. We have a plan. It's working. And with him, we would just go back to square one. Mr. My, my first thought is, how do you actually lose 4,250 people? Uh, then you remember that this is the government that scrapped HS2, but the costs are still rising by billions. This is the government that spent £400 million of taxpayers' money on a Rwanda scheme yet can't deport a single person. And this is the government that waged a week-long war on the Greek Prime Minister for reasons known only to themselves. And suddenly you're reminded that, of course, this farce of a government could lose the people it was planning to remove. But he didn't answer the question, so I'll ask him again. Where are the 4,250 people that the government has lost? Where are they? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, as I said, we've actually identified and removed over 20,000 people from this country back to where they belong. But, but he talks, he asks these questions about the Rwanda scheme, Mr. Speaker. Now, it is important that we get this up and running because it's important, as the National Crime Agency say, that we have a working deterrence to resolve this issue. That's indeed how Australia solved this problem, and that's how Albania has worked for us. But we know he asked these questions, Mr Speaker, about the detail of these things, but we all know he doesn't, he doesn't actually care about solving this problem, and we know this, because when, when the BBC asked him, when the BBC asked him about the Rwanda plan, they quizzed him and they said, if the numbers crossing the channel on small boats decline, i.e. so it's working, would you still reverse it? 
the Labour leader said yes. It's crystal clear he doesn't have a plan and it will be back to square one. Mr Speaker, spending £400 million on a plan not to get anybody to Rwanda whilst losing 4,000 people is not a plan. It's a farce. Uh, uh, only, this, only this government could waste hundreds of millions of pounds on a removals policy that doesn't remove anyone. <laughs> uh, only this government could claim that it's going to get flights off the ground only to discover they couldn't find a plane. <laughs> only, only this government could sign a removal deal with Rwanda only to end up taking people from Rwanda to here. <laughs> but, it, but he still hasn't answered the question. So I'll try again. What progress has he made in locating the 4,250 people his government has apparently lost? He's dodged it three times. Where are they? Mr Speaker, it's the same thing again and again. Here we are talking about what we are doing. But I'm happy, I'm happy to go over it, Mr Speaker. What are we doing? We've increased the number of illegal enforcement raids by 70%, leading to thousands of arrests, using powers, Mr Speaker, that he blocked in this House. We have closed down thousands of bank accounts of illegal workers, again, using powers that he blocked, Mr Speaker. Do you want that early cup of tea? Or are we going to a little bit more silent, Prime Minister? Uh, and Mr. Speaker, as I said, we have worked through a record number of cases and returned a record number of people back to where they've come. All of that is a plan that is working, and we can see that it's working because the numbers of people coming to this country are down by over a third, Mr. Speaker. But again, it is a bit rich to hear him in here pretending that he cares about how we actually stop the boats when he's been crystal clear. He's been crystal clear and said that even if the plan is working to reduce the numbers, he would still scrap it, Mr Speaker. It's because he has no values, no conviction and no plan, and it's back to square one. No, 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 no. (laughs) He hasn't got a clue where they are, has he? I, I I can tell you one place they are, and that's Rwanda. (laughs) <laughs> because the only, the only people who sent to Rwanda is cabinet ministers. And, 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 and for all the words, the ridiculous thing is, we know the Prime Minister himself doesn't even believe in this Rwanda gimmick. He had to be talked out of scrapping the whole thing. He didn't want to fund it. He didn't think it would work. When he sees his party tearing itself apart, hundreds of bald men scrapping over a single broken comb, (laughs) doesn't he wish he'd had the courage to stick to his guns? Well, Mr Mr. Speaker, now, I have absolute (laughs) conviction that the plan we put in place will work. Absolute conviction, because I believe it's important that we grip this problem. Now, he spends a lot of his time in this house talking about his time as a lawyer, Mr Speaker, and I would urge him to listen to them, because Lord Wolfson has said that our bill severely limits the... Four eminent KCs have said that it is undoubtedly the most robust piece of immigration legislation this Parliament has seen. And, And, Mr Speaker, a former Supreme Court... I want to hear what the Prime Minister's got to say, <laughs> because it matters to my constituents, those who feel it doesn't matter to those. Please leave, Prime Minister. As I said, Mr Speaker, four eminent cases said this is undoubtedly the most robust legislation passed, and a former Supreme Court Justice has been clear that the bill would work. But I know, Mr Speaker, he's always been more interested in what lefty lawyers have to say, Mr Speaker. I've even got here. I've even got here the textbook that he authored for them, and it's called, and I quote, "European Human Rights Law" by Keir Starmer. So, Prime Minister, Prime Minister, when I stand up, please sit down. Can I just say? We don't use props in this house, and I will certainly ensure that if you do need reminding, I certainly will. It's such utterly pathetic nonsense. He's been brutally exposed 
by his own MPs yet again. He's got one party chair who says she hopes the Lords will rip his Rwanda deal to pieces. He's got two more who had to quit because they don't think it'll work. All of them appointed by him, all now in open revolt against his policy, each other uh, and reality. <laughs> is, is there any wonder they all think this gimmick is doomed to failure when the Prime Minister himself doesn't believe in it? Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it is rich to hear from the Honourable Gentleman about belief in something because and it will be news to him. It is actually the case that you can believe in something and stick to that position on this side of the house. I mean, I will say to this side. <coughs> oh, hello. Somebody's chipping in from over. Can I just say it's very important. It's an important day. People want to know what's going on. So I want my constituents, just like yours, to hear what the Prime Minister's got to say. Prime Minister. But just this week, Mr Speaker, we had another example of the Honourable Gentleman doing one thing, saying another, because it, 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 this, this week he backed the Home Secretary in banning the terrorist group Hizbut Tahrir, despite him personally using the European Court of Human Rights to try and stop them being banned. And don't take my word for it, Mr Speaker, the extremist's own press release said, and I quote, the Hizbut Tahrir legal team led by Keir Starmer. Now, I know, I know he doesn't like talking about them because they've been a client, but when I see a group chanting jihad on our streets, I ban them. He invoices them. Because there's eight questions that I think some of the, you may want. Well, I'll tell you what, there's some's already gone off the list who wanted them. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, if he stuck to his position, he'd be voting with us. He'd be voting with us. His former Home Secretary says the plan won't work. His current Home Secretary calls it batshit. His former Immigration Minister doesn't back his plan. Even the Prime Minister himself doesn't believe in it. And last week, another of his MPs said the Tories should admit that things have got worse since they came to office, yeah. that after 14 years they've left Britain less united, yeah. the country is a sadder place. Yeah. If the Prime Minister can't even persuade his own MPs that it's worth supporting him, if he himself doesn't even believe in his own policies, why on earth should anyone else think differently? Yeah. Mr Speaker, another week when it's crystal clear the Honourable Gentleman doesn't believe in anything and he doesn't have a plan. Now, while he talks the country down, let me update him on what's actually been happening in the past week. Inflation more than halved from 11% to 4%. Real wages rising. Real wages rising for the fifth month in a row. Last week, rates started falling and millions of people benefited from a tax cut worth £450. So while he takes us back to square one with a £28 billion tax grab, let's stick with a plan that's delivering a brighter future for Britain. Mr Speaker, it's against the law to silence <laughs> victims of crime, but that's exactly what the Post Office did through the use of non-disclosure agreements. And this is just the most recent case of NDAs covering up mismanagement, misconduct and even crimes at work. Will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, consider banning their use in all severance agreements once and for all? Minister. My right honourable friend is right to raise an important point. And the ability to speak out about things is key to unlocking justice. And while NDAs can have a place, uh, my royal friend is right to say that they shouldn't be used to stop victims of crime, in particular getting the justice that they deserve. Uh, I can tell her that the Ministry of Justice are carefully considering how to best address this issue, including legislation. And I know that my right royal friend, the Justice Secretary, will keep the House updated on further progress. Leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, when people woke up today in homes that they can't afford to heat with mortgages that they are struggling to pay to news that inflation is once again on the rise. They'll have looked to Westminster for answers. 
And instead, they find a UK government which is tearing itself apart over how quickly it can send vulnerable people on a plane to Rwanda. Surely the Prime Minister must understand that the anger that some of his own backbenchers have towards him is no comparison to the anger that the public have towards his party. Yeah. Mr Speaker, if the Honourable Gentleman did care about supporting working families to pay their bills, to pay their mortgage, why on earth is the SNP making Scotland the highest tax part of the United Kingdom? Where the average, Mr. Speaker, not the wealthiest, where the average worker in Scotland is now paying more tax than they do in England. Stephen Flynn. Of course, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the, Rio- the Rwanda bill, the reality is that if you want to stop the smuggling gangs, you should introduce safe and legal routes. But instead, the Prime Minister is seeking to weaponise some of the most vulnerable people in society. It is straight out of the cruel and callous right-wing extremist playgroup. His time in office is fast approaching its conclusion. Does he seriously want this to be his legacy? Well, Mr Speaker, as I said, it is important that we stop the boats because illegal migration is simply not fair, Mr Speaker. It's not right that some people jump the queue that they take away our resources to help those who are the most compassionate, that need our most help, and, by the way, Mr Speaker, are exploited by gangs, and many of them lose their lives making these dangerous crossings. So I completely disagree with the Honourable Gentleman. The fair and the compassionate thing to do is to break these criminal gangs, and that's why we're going to stop the boats. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Unexpectedly, five months ago, I had a half- 17 minutes after 12 is the time. Just to to tell a lie, it's just gone 18. We will pick over the bones of what we've just heard with Natasha Clark shortly, but let me give you a flavour of what you're saying on the... uh, I'll go with Anthony and Tooting, who says it's a load of old baldrick. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 21 minutes after 12. Natasha Clark is with us. Um... The, 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 I mean, the, there's always complaints. There are always complaints that the Prime Minister doesn't answer the questions at PMQs. But I don't know that I can remember it in recent memory being quite as stark as that. It's a fairly straightforward question. 4,250 asylum seekers have gone missing. The failed asylum seekers or just asylum? I think they're people that were processing. in hotels. They right. were waiting for their cases to be pro- okay. processed. Um, and yes, and, and the Keir question Starmer is, asking, where are what's they? What's happened to, to them? To which you can either answer, they're there, or you can answer, I don't know, or you can do what Rishi Sunak did and just ignore it completely. Yeah, yeah, not a great look. And like, I, he could have come back on this. He could have come back and said, well, actually, it's just proof that our asylum system isn't working because we've got so many of these hotels. People are absconding to go and work in the black market to go and you know try and get jobs to try and whatever. He there were answers that he could have come back on then, but he just instead decided to completely dodge it do with 360 and blame it back on Keir Starmer and he's got no plan. Because he wasn't expecting it, was he? Yeah, I don't think so. It wasn't one of the things I would have expected. He was expecting Rwanda-related criticism, in which case listing all the things that he can claim are getting better, even though obviously they've been in power for 14 years and most of these problems are of their own making. Mm. That list of, uh, quotes, achievements, end quotes, wasn't relevant to the question he was asked and he wasn't fleet of foot enough to... To do something no, different. No, he wasn't. He, he couldn't. Uh, he couldn't. Uh, you know, think on his feet and go. Actually, there is a way, and I think there is a way that he could have got around that question, but he was not able and agile enough to do so. And yes. we do see from from both of them that they're quite rehearsed uh, prime minister's yes. questions these days. And you know, I, I wonder if Rishi Sunak has maybe spent a little bit less time this week rehearsing for prime minister's questions because he's got a lot of other things on his plate, namely a brewing Tory rebellion later today. I, and it's been noticed. My, my texts are always interesting, They're particularly interesting on Wednesdays because I, I can de- I can detect directions of traffic and they're, they're pretty equitable, actually. If Sunak gets the better of Starmer, people will point it out. But mm. this is a theme that Kate has picked up on in Surrey. She says, Sunak is like, it's like he's being asked what he'd like to eat in a pub. Um, and and uh, d- d- asking for a, for a lemonade. What would you like to eat? I'll have a lemonade. Lemonade, please. please it yeah. reminds me. Did you, did you watch the Fast Show? You're much younger than me. So Sorry, there was a, there was time. there was a scene in the first sketch in the Fast Show when a bloke would be sent out to buy stuff for his wife. And um, well, I was reminded of that a bit. Hello, dear. How's it going? Oh, I think I'm on top of it. 
Now, did you get the eggs, the butter, and the potatoes? Even better than that, I've got some biscuit shaped like radios, a map of Cairo, and an ice pick. <laughs> So Tom says, where of the 4,250 uh, missing asylum seekers gone? And Richie Sunak goes, even better than that. I've got some biscuits shaped like radios, a map of Cairo and an ice pick. Um, no, anyway, that's what it reminded me of. Yeah, it, it didn't sound great, did it? It just sounds, again, like another politician dodging a question that they don't want to answer, and, and, which is and exactly what it was. Clever tactics of Starmer to do it three or four times to yeah. come back with it. Because I, for Keep me, on it. Sunak looks weaker every time. He, he, he obviously fails to even pretend to be answering the, the, the relevant question. Exactly. And he try, he try, they're, they're trying the Tories this new attack line. Clearly, it's, it's, re, it's obviously resonated with some focus groups. Clearly, that's why they're using it again and again. Back to square one with yeah. Starmer. It, nice alliteration, I'll give them that. But is it going to resonate with the public? Like I say, there must be some evidence that it has been because they wouldn't be using it, I don't think, if they, they would just magic it out of thin air. Um, that, you know, this guy doesn't have a plan. And they're using the same attack that they were using on the economy. He doesn't have a plan for the economy. Yeah. Now they're using it for migration too while their own policy they, I mean it is a bizarre state of affairs when they're tearing each other's to shreds over mm -hmm. their own plan and accusing the other fellow of not having one yeah and I thought we would get into that a little bit earlier with Sir Keir Starmer yes. I thought yes, that I he would he use did. some of those you know quotes that he did eventually use from some of those Tory rebels and mm. you know you don't you don't back it so many of your MPs don't even Mm. like it don't think it was going to work um, and he did eventually get into that but it did take him a little while didn't it so yes and there are lawyers who aren't persuaded by the efficacy of this bill as well so yes. Starmer again not, not being not, not, not turning on a sixpence in a way that he might have done yes true and I, he did sort of go in a little bit into the, the argument of th these lawyers are, are having kicking back a bit of the government today because the government have said well actually we'll put more in the upper upper tiers of the judiciary system to get through what they expect will be quite a lot of appeals mm. um for people who are going to be deported to Rwanda and they're saying the judges are saying actually butt out that's for us to decide not for you yes yes exactly um I, I and, and the square one you say it would poll well I, I wonder now because I was looking at some of the stuff the Telegraph did this week with the um 70,000 pounds worth of, of opaquely funded opinion polling that's been dominating their front page and it, part of it depends on how you ask the question. So you, if it I always said, does, yeah. Yes, if I say to you, do you think Rwanda's a big deal? You might say yes. Uh, but if, if I say to you, where would you put it on a list of 20 things that you want mm -hmm. the government to be doing? You might also put it 20th. You yeah, could it depends see. where you say Rwanda, depends whether you say migration, because mm. we know that you know the pollsters tend to poll issues rather than a specific policy most of the time. And we know that migration is always an issue that comes in that top five usually issues. But Rwanda, people don't tend to... To put the two and two together i think the, the the public obviously completely have issues about migration they completely have concerns about it but do they back the rwanda policy mm -hmm. there's less supportive polling on whether people actually think that this plan is the right plan and also whether they think it's going to work at all right and, and i don't even know how much intellectual or political capital the average person is expending on it to be honest with you. i don't it's, think so it doesn't like... pop up in my inboxes where, where people are obsessing about it they might as you say have varying degrees of obsession with the question of immigration in general mm -hmm. but but if the rwanda thing were to succeed on an unprecedented scale it's not going to make much of a dent in the bigger quotes problem end quote i don't think so but it obviously tapped back into the problem that rishi sunak has to hold on to that those red wall seats right where mm -hmm. immigration traditionally the traditionally voted more heavily in favour of Brexit mm. and he needs to hang on to those. All of the evidence shows that those are exactly where he's going to lose seats, according to that MRP poll in the Telegraph, but also basically every poll that's been done shows that they're losing support in the Red Wall because they went on Brexit in 2019 with Boris Johnson as mm. Prime Minister leading that charge and now they need to have an offer to the Red Wall. So is migration going to play a part in the election? Of course it will, but it shouldn't be the main part in the election because I think, as, as you're right, I don't think it resonates with the entire public in a way that perhaps it did five years ago yeah, it puts some people off it puts some conservatives off as yeah. well this I, I, james arbuthnot speaking yesterday about a xenophobic streak in, in in his own party that that he finds particularly uh unpalatable and um, they didn't um they, they didn't go near the what was the other thing you suggested there was there was something else that didn't come up and i was surprised it didn't come up did talk about inflation but, but yeah, the prime minister ignored the fact that inflation has yes. gone down today gone up 
sorry, gone up today. And do we know why it's gone up? Well, it has gone up, funnily enough, um, <laughs> economists think. <laughs> this, is quite, this is quite good. This is quite good. They've, they've shot themselves in the foot here. The Office for National Statistics says today the main cause of unanticipated growth in inflation was increased tobacco prices due to higher taxes. So high, higher taxes on tobacco introduced on tobacco, by Jeremy which Hunt. Which was... Uh, increased at the last budget, I believe. So people are still smoking on, on a sufficient scale to tip inflation tip upwards inflation. after yes. the price of fags goes up. Yep. But it's, it's a sh- shot um, in the foot. Yeah, like, that, uh, Rishi Sunak's inflation um, you know, message has now been completely lost it's due to his own chancellor, which is pretty poor. The ONS also says it was the cost of alcohol. Again, we know that alcohol, again, very heavily taxed in this country um, and has gone up. I think um, the spirits um, campaigners are saying today that um, it, uh, inflation on spirits has now gone up from around 3.5% last year to now 8.9%. So it's fueling inflation because of our high tax rates. <laughs> and Rishi Sunak has then the audacity to talk to the SNP about their high tax system in Scotland, which is, I don't think that's an argument that resonates. Everyone knows that the taxes has gone up under the Conservative Party. And finally, the prop. Now, would he have known that he was going to get told off for that, but consider that it was worth it? I was impressed to learn that. Keir Starmer was a lawyer of sufficient repute that he'd actually write a textbook referred to by every state in the European Union. But that's a conversation for a different day. I didn't know that you were not allowed to use props in right. this way because I know that Prime Ministers, and I'm recalling a specific incident with where David Cameron waved a piece of paper at Prime Minister's questions yeah, with a might... specific article on. Is oh, that okay. a, was that? And I don't remember the Speaker at the time calling him out on that. He may have done. The I could be wrong. Between a piece of paper and, and, a, book and a booklet. Or, What's the know? difference there? No, I didn't know that was question. that was the case. But yes, I mean, so, so Lin, uh, Lindsay Hall was a bit grumpy at that Prime Minister's questions, wasn't it? He oh, yeah. is. Um, he kept trying to ruin the vibe. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, technical term. I, I I read a couple of these because it's a recurring theme. You picked up on the square one uh, 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 slogan, as it were. Uh, Stephen Wright's first time texter. I think I'm looking lovingly back at the days of square one, James, <laughs> rather too. than the nightmare of Octagon 77, which we appear to have been living in for the last 14 years. And um, and, and Sean in Wiltshire says, is the square one they talk about 2010 rather than the state of the country after 14 years of Tory government? If so, I'd take that in a heartbeat. Ben in Exeter says, back to square one sounds quite appealing to me right now. It feels like we aren't even on the board at the moment. I can't see that line working. Anna says, back to square one before them sounds kind of good to me. Um, And Mike points out that it's not just the fast show that Rishi Sunak was channeling there. There was also a touch of that famous two Ronnie sketch where Ronnie Corbett is answering the question before the one that Ronnie Barker actually asked. I may have got that the wrong way around, but I, but I take your point. It's an extremely clever sketch. Natasha Clark, thank you. Amelia Cox has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.36 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I, I like this from David. I, sometimes if you send me a good joke, I don't know whether you've made it up yourself or whether you've nicked it off someone else. And I've got no way of knowing, but I, I work on a I work on a very trusting basis on this programme, as you know. So I shall give David the credit for this. He says, do you think that Rwanda might be breaking international law by sending refugees to an unsafe country like the UK? Um which is so good, I shall probably be passing it off as my own by the end of the week. Speaking of passing stuff off as my own, so someone posted a screenshot of my my new book, my well, my latest book. When does it stop being new and start become latest? Is, that, is there a date? Is there a cut-off date on that? And Anyway, my latest book, um, in which I said something about the rules governing political advertising being considerably, measurably less stringent than the rules governing the sale of washing powder. It was something that became particularly pertinent and, and, and particularly awful during during the Brexit referendum, actually. But it's been true for years. And it, and it reminded me of a chap that I met some years ago when he just set up an organisation called Reform Political Advertising. And then as if by magic, Alex Tate got in touch with me two days later, um, uh, uh, reminding me that I had promised to give him more uh, coverage and 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 attention um, as his campaign gathered pace. So first of all, Alex, apologies for taking so long to get back to you. Thanks for me on. Well, there you go. Better late than never. <laughs> um, and second of all, let's just do a quick recap on what the reform, the RPA, um, is, and and why and how you and your colleague Benedict Pringle set it up. 
We're, um, yeah, essentially the campaign is focused on preventing lies in election ads. Um, as we're a not for profit, politically neutral campaign. Um, but as you pointed out, well, we've got a background in marketing and advertising. Uh, and as you pointed out, we found it really ridiculous that when you're advertising a chocolate bar, you've got four sets of regulations that you've got to abide by uh, to ensure that it's accurate. And when you're running an election advertising campaign, trying to influence votes uh, in the UK, uh, you've got none. And so we just think as we head towards the general election, uh, especially with technology uh, developments accelerating, it's incredibly important that some action's taken around this. W was there a moment of realisation for you when you sort of did a double take and, and, and slapped your forehead and thought, crikey, I can't believe it. If I was doing political advertising instead of product advertising, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be absolutely unregulated. Uh, I think there's been several instances mm. like that um, across the time that we've been doing it. Um, it's, we actually think, I think, the, one of the biggest themes of our times is misinformation and disinformation. Yes. It's not just us saying that. It's, uh, the World Economic Forum uh, released a report, um, its Global Risks Register, ahead of Davos this week. And mm. it had number one on that list ahead of climate change in the short term is AI-driven misinformation and disinformation because of the amount of um, elections going on. And as a subset of that, we think election advertising is... Um, really something we've got to get a handle on quickly. If you've got a politician that comes in here and he's trying to get a dodgy stat past you, mm. you're going to hold him, hold, you're going to, going to hold into account. Uh, if you've got election ads running with disinformation in them, it's a channel direct into the public uh, to put that into the public discourse. And not only that, it amplifies uh, the disinformation too. Um, some of the spending limits have just increased significantly in the run-up to the general election. So, th so this this election, we think, is going to be the dirtiest that we've seen in the UK. And um, that's why we think some action needs to be taken. And so does the public. It's odd, isn't it? 87% of voters uh, agreed with the statement that it should be a legal requirement that factual claims in political adverts must be accurate. How, do we have any indication of, or any idea of how many realise that it's not a legal requirement? Uh, we do, yes. We did run that a couple of years ago. And the large majority of the public aren't aware that there aren't Just any rules. Just presume it's being policed. Well, you could you? argue it makes it even more effective of in course. some ways. Yes, exactly that. Advertising like that. And I think actually as you, like one of the, the themes I suppose um, at the moment is around AI certainly mm. in the advertising industry um, and we think that's got the potential to really turbocharge this situation over the next couple of months. Um, I'll give you another example. Yeah, do. Um, uh, a research report I think gave us a taste of this last week where it identified there were 100 deep fake um, paid Facebook Rishi Sunak ads uh, that got a, over the last month that got a reach of 400,000 on Facebook and it's just a taste of of, of things to come really um, so you know as this as our campaigns developed we've been thinking about actions that can be taken um, and we gave uh, evidence to uh, in 2020 actually uh, just just uh, uh, the year after I mm. last met you and um, we gave evidence to the House of Lords Democracy and Digital Technology Committee um, that was a cross-party group and had one of its unanimous recommendations that was supported by all the parties uh, to support what we're advocating for election advertising um, regulation um, and in the absence of that regulation um, we've put together a code um, there's quite a simple ask of the parties in the run-up to the general election uh, that we're going to be uh, approaching the parties um, and asking them to support. And it's quite simply just asking them to be accurate in their uh, election ads. And if uh, an ad is found to be misleading, that they'll correct the record and uh, and, and do something about it. Yeah. You'd think that's quite a simple ask of well, the parties. Well, uh, no, normal people might. I'm thinking about how they respond to real-time fact checks or requests from people like the Office of National Statistics not to repeat untruths in the actual House of Commons. But mm. I, I noticed this week that some Tories are still claiming um, uh, victories on crime statistics that have been revealed to be completely meaningless because they compare a period where computer crime and fraud was not counted with a period when it was. Um, I, 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 just to take you back to 2020, that was David Putnam's... He was the chair of, That's that, right, yeah. of, that, of that committee. And um, the, 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 I think you, your organisation described the government's response as evasive, going a little further and saying, it is clear that the party in power wishes to preserve its freedom 
to misinforming advertising. Now, I'm not being the devil's advocate, but why would I sign up to something? So we're not um, advocating... Uh, there's no... Um, the, there's not, it's not impairing freedom of speech. All we're asking... No, I know, but rights. why... If I, if I am... Ben, if, look, I am a Tory, mm. let's say, and, and that's partly because of my own political leanings and partly because they've been in power for 14 years. I won the last general election by lying. I got Brexit over the line by lying. I got Boris Johnson into Downing Street by lying. I'm Rishi Sunak and I'm still lying. And I'm doing that in person and on telly and in radio studios. And, and you're a bit optimistic if you think they're going to get held to account by the average client journalist in, in many corners of the, of the British media. So it's working brilliantly for me. And now we're going to do loads of Facebook stuff. We're going to get big Dominic Cummings back on the case. And we're going to be pumping all sorts of nonsense into your Auntie Doris's Facebook account. And we'll probably win that battle as well by lying. Mm. Why would I sign up to a code that forbids me from lying? Well, so... We don't think there's an option, really. When you look at how trust is being degraded in politics, you look at these developments we've been talking about, mm. around technology, um, you've got a lot of parties at the moment talking about wanting to clean up politics and to detoxify politics. Um, and actually, we need some of the parties to start walking the walk rather than talking the talk. Who is? Um, so um, just in fact, we just launched it this week and we've had um, we're uh, delighted that the Green Party has been the first to officially support it. Um, and actually pretty much every opposition MP that we speak to supports the concept of it. We just need um, when we speak to them about it, we just need um, some leadership from the parties to actually um, take some action on it. You're busy um, on Friday. What are you doing on Friday morning? Uh I could be free. Why don't you ring in when Sadiq Khan is here and get him to publicly commit to supporting it? Yeah, OK. Well, all right, don't tell anyone that this is what we're planning. Everyone keep this under your hats, all right? But I think we should do that. So, Because what yeah, I was yeah, thinking, up for that. listening to you, is, is you need more people in studios to actually put it directly to politicians and Absolutely. say, why aren't you signing it? The Green yeah. Party have signed up for it. Why haven't you? And also, actually... Um, I think uh, your listeners can do something about it too. So we're no, not for profit. Don't, camp. don't don't overestimate their ability, Alex. <laughs> well, if they're passionate about it, and uh, uh, you are, what we're can they do? I'm joking, obviously. Yeah, well, what, tell us what they can do. We're a not-for-profit campaign. If they go onto our website, it takes a minute. It's reformpoliticaladvertising.org. They can email their MP and ask them to sign up to the code. That's reformpoliticaladvertising.org. And we're going to be, um, as we have been doing over the last couple of years, uh, we're going to be running. Um, a project tracking all the misleading ads in the run-up to the general election important. Um, to, to surface Well, we those. can help with that. And, you, uh, yeah, and if, if people want to um, send any ads to us and also track the progress of all of that, um, our Twitter's Clear Politics uh, with a five as the last S. That's Clear Politics with a five as the last S. And reformpoliticaladvertising.org. So I'll Get, take you up on that offer on Friday. Yeah, do that. Seriously, have a word with Eleanor afterwards and we'll, we'll make sure that happens, see what he has to say on the subject. Final question, not, not necessarily... a one you'd be expecting were you expecting to have achieved more by now when you set this up in 2018 because i know when i spoke to you in 2019 and you still have the zeal of an evangelist mm. but the egregiousness of the problem you were describing was so obvious that mm. i felt you thought this as soon as people find out about it then we'll be unstoppable um yeah but i think maybe um over the last first couple of years um, but actually, as the years have progressed, the um, ability for uh, and actually the effect that disinformation has on our elections has actually become more apparent yes. as we've been tracking it. You've got, if you look over the last couple of election cycles, obviously the, take the Johnson landslide out of the yeah. equation. Um, there's been quite a few um, sort of quite close run mm. elections. Um, and then actually we've been tracking it at a local level as well. And some of those are incredibly uh, close. Mm. Mm. Um, and, you know, there are examples like um, one of the most trailed by-elections, obviously, last year was the Uxbridge by-election. Yes. Um, and yes, uh, of course. the main, uh, the margin of victory, of, I think there were 30,000 votes cast yeah. in that. Yeah. The margin of victory was 500. Yes. And the main uh, campaign vehicle that was uh, used by the Conservatives was a fake newspaper called the Stop U.S. Times uh, that had in a, an imprint, had very small letters uh, uh, that it was the promoter it was from. Um, but the rules around imprints are so inadequate, you don't even have to say what party it's from. Right. So actually, so it uh, looked looking independent, at that, or it looked, looked like it was from a campaign genuine, print. or by an yeah. and presumably some some fibs about 
the, the likelihood of your car being susceptible for the ULES charge as well. But I shall go to reformpoliticaladvertising.org to find out more. And I shall tweet something from your account, Clear Politics, um, with, a, with a five in place of the final S so that people who follow me can start following you, Thanks, Alex James. Tate. No, thank you. And, I, and I'm sorry that I didn't get back to you quicker. It seems four years feels, feels like a long time, but I just wanted to make sure that you were in it for the long run. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yes, it's, it's not going to be easy, but no, it's super it's very, important. very, very important. And I admire your, um, your zeal and your optimism and your principles, actually. 12.48 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 12.51. Um, quick heads up for this week's Full Disclosure. And last week's, actually, because I was off on Friday. I had Stephanie Beecham in the studio for Full Disclosure last week, um, who is a, a wonderful woman, fascinating career. I did the whole shebang from Hollywood to Coronation Street and utterly, utterly delightful. So if you haven't listened to that, then do check it out. And as a rather beautiful illustration of just how wide we cast our net with full disclosure, this week's guest is Nick Wallace, the journalist who did, I think it's fair to say, he didn't break the story, but he probably did more than any other to ensure that the post office scandal uh, achieved the denouement of sorts that it achieved earlier this year with the Mr. Bates versus the post office drama on ITV and the subsequent political conflagration that, that, that continues. And, and while talking to Nick, and indeed while talking to you, about the post office scandal, quite a few previous examples of comparable, um, well, I'm going to repeat the word scandal, I, I, I think it's the only one that fits, were cited. None more pertinent, I feel, than the Windrush scandal. And that is why I was drawn to a piece in yesterday's Guardian by Amelia Gentleman, who, a bit like Nick Wallace, I suppose, is, is the journalist who has done more than any other to, to propel the Windrush scandal and the, and the continuing betrayals into the public space picked up on the parallels, not not least by um, opening her article with a description of Janet McKay-Williams watching the drama with, with a rising sense of fury. And, and Amelia is with me now because, Amelia, very simply put, there were uh, unbearable and um, almost innumerable parallels. Uh, yes, hello, yes, that's right. Um, I've spoken to a number of people affected by the Windrush scandal over the past fortnight. Um, all of them have been obviously paying attention to the response to the um, post office um, TV drama. Um, and there are very strong parallels between the two issues. Um, in both cases, uh, it involves groups of people who suffered really huge systemic injustices over a prolonged period of time, which were simply ignored despite their persistent attempts to get politicians to pay attention. Um, and in both cases, the um, suffering was really, really severe. People. Um, caught up in the Windrush scandal, who were misclassified as illegal immigrants. Um, many of them lost their jobs, their homes, were wrongly imprisoned or had nervous breakdowns, um, were even um, in a few cases dri driven to suicide. So there are these very um, stark parallels. When you uh, broke this story or, 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 or um, put it into the, into the public space, if you'd looked this far down the road ahead, would you, would you have expected more to have been done by now? I mean, I think that, that that's what's quite sobering, yes. listening um, to the um, very effusive apologies that we're, we're hearing on, on the post office issue and this really in, intense focus from ministers giving commitments to setting it right, um, that there is this echo of the um, sudden rush in April 2018 from the government to say, we're so sorry, we're going to fix this, um, we'll set up a compensation scheme, we'll set up a, um, a comprehensive reform program to make the Home Office a, a, a better place. And I think for a while, um, I really believe that that was going to happen yeah, quickly yeah. as as did um as did people affected and five six years on um there is a lot that still hasn't um been achieved what, what are the most egregious examples of that well it's it's two things in parallel there is this compensation scheme and people absolutely should claim and and 
push to get compensation. It's proved very difficult for a number of people. We know that over 40 people have died in the period between making applications um, but before receiving any money because it's a very slow and um, difficult process to, to get absolutely right. So there are problems with the compensation scheme, although the Home Office will say that they've they paid out 75 million pounds and they're committed to continuing with that process um on the other um kind of area of concern is the commitment to make really comprehensive reforms to the to the home office and a lot of work went into that um but as the issue has kind of receded from public attention it's also yeah. been something that ministers have, have swept under the carpet and and last year suella braverman very prematurely shut down an internal um transformation unit that was meant to be working on on putting all of those reforms in place and and her feeling was um you know that the job had been done and it was time to move on or, or perhaps and i know you wouldn't say this but equally one could suggest her feeling was that the spotlight had moved on and therefore she could close it down regardless of whether the work had been completed or the mission accomplished <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I think um, the, the difficulty is that there are kind of pro bono lawyers yeah. all, all over the place in, in law centres like the North Kensington Law Centre or the Great, Greater Manchester Law Centre who are having to pick up the pieces and are, are kind of trying to, to do the work for, for claimants who are having difficulty um, in, in, in the face of um, yeah, on, ongoing problems with the compensation scheme and in, and in the face of um, this failure to fully enact all of the promises that mm. were made. Is, is there any reason to expect better from her successor in the Home Office, James Cleverly? James Cleverly so hasn't far? spoken about the Windrush scandal oh. yet, which I think is is um, emblematic of, of how far it has receded from um, the, the public attention. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's good that it's being um, mentioned again um, in, in the context of, of the post office. But um, yeah, ca campaigners have to keep going and, they, they and do. raising the issue. And, and Sadiq Khan and others have suggested that the, that the, the, that the cause would benefit from a, 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 a drama of a comparable length and quality of, of, of the post office one. I know there have been some stories told on television and there were others that didn't reach the public because of, of COVID. But did, I mean, it sounds a bit glib, but at the same time, it, this is, I'm sure you've noted or you've been writing about it, it's been an extraordinary and, and utterly unprecedented relationship between public and political interest and, and, a, and, a, and a self-contained drama. It, it would be pretty good, wouldn't it, to, to see the, the, this issue get tackled in a similar way? The stories are yes. at least as powerful. <laughs> the stories you've is. told in your book are at least as powerful. Sadiq Khan is absolutely right. Yes. There should be um, a, a four-hour-long drama. ITV should commission it, you know, immediately. There's no shortage of um, incredibly powerful stories that need to be, be told. Um, people are still not familiar enough with Britain's colonial past, with the um, increasingly racist immigration um, legislation that was passed in the late 20th century that caused so many of these problems and with how that interacted with the um, introduction of the, the hostile environment under Theresa May's um, time at the Home Office. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are, there's that kind of historical backdrop, which is very, very interesting. But there are also um, important stories that people, you know, really, I think, would find fascinating to engage with in a dramatic form around how um, the state really cruelly treated um, thousands of people who were and are British uh, citizens. Thank you, Amelia. Amelia Gentleman's book, The Windrush Betrayal, Exposing the Hostile Environment, is... Um Highly recommended by me, as indeed is a, a, a new book called um, Empire Land by Satnam Sangira, which I've had an early look at and which looks into a lot of the issues that you have just heard Amelia refer to. And, and Satnam is joining us, I think, next week to, to tell us a little bit more about that. I, I just want to read you something before we go. I, I don't know if you were listening to the second hour of the program when we spoke about funeral costs and Carl got in touch from the hospital where he was... Um, uh, looking after his, his dying brother. Carl has been back in touch with a rather remarkable message that I thought I must share with you. 
Uh, hi, James. My brother died about 15 minutes after you read the text out. I just want to say thank you for your compassion and your understanding, and I know that lots of people will have heard that segment and realise that they're not alone. So thanks. From Carl. Thank you, Carl. Uh, and, and good luck, and God bless. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, Pause, Rewind, Live Radio, all LBC shows to catch up on there, as well as the world's biggest podcasts. Pause and Rewind Live Radio on Global Player, where you're always in control. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC. 